welcome to the summer school and, and uh, welcome to all the attendees who are joining. I see there's people still trickling in on the Zoom uh, meeting. So if you're coming in now, welcome wherever you might be. Um, it's good morning to those of us that are here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, <laughs> Hyun, what, what time zone are you in? Central or? Uh, central. Central. So you're two hours. You're two hours ahead of us. It's 10:30 there. So anyway, um, I'm still eating my breakfast. So I'm going to turn this over to Hyun. And so we're we're excited for this morning. Uh, we have a a full half morning, a full half day, a full morning of public presentations. And um, over the last two days, we've learned an awful lot about uh, molecular data, both genomics data and uh, data describing the character of organic matter, metabolomics data and how those data are collected and how they're processed and analyzed. Today, we're gonna to take the next step, which is taking those data and using them to formulate metabolic reaction networks for communities of organisms or individual organisms, and how to then solve those reaction networks to describe the metabolic activity of a community or an organism in the context of a particular environment. And that will take us then to the next step of putting those that information into reactive transport models, which will be our topic tomorrow. So we have some presentations this morning on metabolic network building and metabolic reaction modeling. And our first speaker is Hyun Sab Song, a professor from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And he is, um, has written uh, an excellent review paper on the diversity of different types of metabolic models. It's, uh, what, a few years old now? Back in, what, 2000, maybe 15, 14? Okay. Yeah, so um, definitely I'll put a link to that paper into the Discord chat. I would encourage you to look that up. And um, Hyun, I would invite you to give us uh, an overview of metabolic modeling. So thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, can you see my slide? Yes, it looks good. It's in screen mode. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Hyun Sub Song, um, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, I'll be talking about an like, overview of different approaches of uh, metabolic modeling. And as Tim uh, introduced, today we'll focus on metabolic network building and then flux balance analysis using the genome skeletal models from metagenomes or MEX or, uh, and also we'll be talking about the integration of uh, metabolomics data to expand the scope of metabolic network modeling. So you'll hear a lot about flux balance analysis uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the tutorial sessions by Jenica. And then uh, Chris also talk, will be here about metabolic flux analysis from Markov of map to me. But what I'm going to talk today is without focusing one approach, I'll talk about broad range of metabolic modeling approaches that are complementary in nature. So uh, this is the uh, quotation that motivated my talk. And uh, those who study microbial communities that you may uh, know this uh, statement that microorganisms do not live in isolation, but similarly, metabolic models do not exist in isolation. So, uh, to fully understand what these models are and what can do, we have to look at their relatives and the family they belong to. So, this is a quotation from late Rutherford Harris in his book, 1978. Mathematical modeling techniques models, models are never fully understood except in relation to other members of the family to which they belong. So, if you are familiar with the old school like a classification of cell population modeling, and then uh, you may heard about this criteria: the segregated model. If population is segregated into individual organisms. This model, segregated model, otherwise unsegregated model. And if model accounts for internal chemical composition or physical structure is called structured model, otherwise unstructured model. And if the states of individual cells defined by their internal chemical composition and physical structures are not the same, and the model accounts for this variation, the model is called distributed. 
otherwise non-distributed. Also, metabolic processes or cell growth, they are intrinsically stochastic. So if the model account for that, these random processes is a stochastic model, otherwise deterministic model. And here on the right, you can see there's some graphical uh, classification of a model based on what I said just here, segregated versus unsegregated, structured versus unstructured, and then deterministic versus stochastic. And population mass model is one of the approaches that handle deterministic model. And there are some connection uh, between this deterministic model that do not use the population mass model can be reduced into unstructured model under simplifying assumptions. And interestingly, this classification come from like Chuchia et al. and Fredrickson, Ramakrishna, they are all from University of Minnesota. And I think this classification is still uh, inspirational and then uh, found in the textbooks. And I, I, I refer to those classifications for my work. And in this talk, I do not cover segregated, distributed, or stochastic modeling, but to cover structured versus, versus unstructured modeling. So those segregation model were distributed. Stochastic models are important issue for modeling cell population and their variation. But here, here what we are going to talk about is that metabolic modeling and then uh, focusing on like a uniform distribution of cells, but still we are focusing on whether they are structured or unstructured, how they are regulated or unregulated. So, I'll be using uh, some graphical representation uh, for metabolic systems and I identified three key components in describing metabolic models here. First of all, network below here is the metabolic network and arrows represent fluxes and nodes here rep metabolize. Also these reactions and uh, metabolite production consumption, they are regulated by genetic circuit. So I hear uh, another level of uh, network is called genetic network and a regulatory network. And also my classification or this question is so dependent on whether this model can account for dynamic interaction with environment. Therefore, depending on uh, how they account for these three elements, I'll have a structured versus unstructured model or depending on how they account for genetic regulation, it can be fully mechanistic model or cybernetic or kinetic model, and also dynamic versus in static model. So yesterday I promised to talk about the cybernetic modeling approach more. So I have a few slides on that today. And cybernetic models um, is a sort of AI based model. So they assume and they view microorganisms as uh, artificially intelligent systems. So uh, we think human beings are intelligent. That's true, we have a brains, but that does not necessarily mean our behaviors are intelligent. They are different. Intelligent being and being intelligent are different concepts. So for example, I make a lot of mistakes every day and I say few stu stupid words every day to get my friends and family angry. Even in the morning that I was in a panic for two seconds by looking at my watch at 8.45. I was in panic because, oh, I had to talk at 8.30, but I realized, oh yeah, I'm in Nebraska in Central Time, so therefore. So this is one recent example of being non-intelligent. So by contrast, microorganisms are not intelligent beings, but their behaviors look intelligent in many cases. So because they had to survive like a, a continuous variation of environment through a long history of time. They had to adapt to new environment and their genetic circuit has been evolved to cope with those variation environment for a long time period. Therefore, they, their, the way they regulate their metabolic reactions on the varying environment, very, very intelligent. They know what to eat, what to consume first and what next how to change their metabolic reactions under different context and time, uh, time and conditions. So cybernetic model really uh, focus on their intelligent uh, behaviors. So 
The term cybernetic comes from Greek word meaning the art of steering. Then, and they set up the cybernetic necessary set of goal and describe actions taken to achieve that goal. So here you, can, you have a ship and the arriving in an island is their goal. So this is optimal pass without any obstacles, but while they're navigating the sea, there will be winds against it. Also, there are rocks, therefore they had to change their direction and then the way to approach to the goal. So that this should be determined dynamically. So cybernetic model um, describe metabolic system as a dynamic control system and then uh, predict their behavior every time step depending on their environmental conditions. There are great, there is a great analogy or relationship to a machine learning technique called reinforced learning. Reinforced learning builds up intelligence based on feedback close, feedback close loop. Therefore, they also have, um, so I, if I take the same uh, example here, and then this is agent. Agent uh, detect or sense, senses environmental condition and take actions based on uh, existing policy. And then they evaluate the outcome of their actions, whether act, these actions really promoted uh, their goal or not. Depending on their positive and negative uh, effect, this can be reward or penalty. And based on that, they update their policy. And then this update iteratively goes on through this feedback cycle. In the cybernetic model, cybernetic model assumes that this iterative learning is done. Already, the system has an optimal policy. Therefore, it knows how to respond optimally to the change of in, in, in environment. So that's a difference. Therefore, cybernetic model has developed only the pre in advance, develop the optimal control laws and then predict how microorganisms will respond to the change in the environment. So more specifically, the cybernetic model really focuses on the optimal regulation of their metabolic uh, pathways. So regulation occurs through transcriptional and translational regulation. And so uh, bi biochemical reaction uh, require, involve the enzymes as a catalyst. If there's a substrate and in order to uh, metabolize this substrate enzyme, many different enzymes should be involved. This enzyme should be produced through, through these pathways and then uh, probably their goal is to maximize the production of a biomass. And if there is an alternative substrate and then cell should synthesize different set of enzymes. Some of the enzymes are still uh, commonly valid, but there are distinct enzymes that should be uh, synthesized fresh. Therefore, cell has to make a decision because cell has a limited internal resources. Internal resources include like ribosome, RNA polymerases, ATP. These are resources for, required for the synthesis of new enzymes. Therefore, these resources are limited. Cell has to make a good decision how to use these resources for the synthesis of the selective enzyme. And so, most fundamentally, we can uh, describe this uh, regulation as a fundamental level, but uh, unfortunately, detailed regulatory mechanisms are not completely known. This is particularly true for environmental microorganisms. We do not know how they regulate the, their, their um, enzyme synthesis and then metabolic pathways. So cybernetic model replaced this part using cybernetic control law. This is an example of cybernetic control laws. Matching and proportional loss, these, were, these are derived from solving optimal control problem in advance. So we don't have to solve it every time, just the equations are already available. So mechanistic details of regulations are replaced with a direct description of enzyme synthesis and activity controlled by two control variables, UI and BI here. And also, if you look at the UI value, there's a, there's a summation of one meaning that this accounts for metabolic burden. When resources are used for the synthesis of one set of enzyme, this cannot be used for other set of enzyme. Therefore, regulation allocation becomes an important problem.
And I have shown uh, this figure yesterday, and this is a uh, dioxic growth of left CL oxytocin and on glucose and xylose. Glucose is preferred substrate, therefore it really promotes the growth a lot. And then uh, after glucose is depleted, there's a lag phase for changing, shift, shifting the enzyme setting from glucose to another, the light xylose, and then it grows again. But in this case, growth rate is slower than the case on glucose. So this is an old example, but even now you can find a paper from NatureCom and then they used a cybernetic model and then uh, modeled how different groups of amino acids, in this case, of four groups of amino acids were used for the experiments and use the cybernetic model, how cybernetic model is effective in simulating, predicting their sequential and then simultaneous consumption of these multiple uh, sources. So even in the application to environmental system, uh, this is the one example I, I talked about yesterday, but this is another one. And then, so in our experiment, we observed very uh, complex phenomenon says that in denied denitrification process, we observed significant time delay in gene expression. So this is a nitrate uh, consumption profile and data and simulation. And if you look at the gene expression level of NARG and nab a genes, this is the genes that are catalyzing the first step of denitrification process. Their levels goes up even after nitrate is depleted. So maximum was found here from experimental data that we couldn't identify why this happens. And we used the cybernetic model and explained probably the interplay between genes and environmental variables and through regulation can cause this delay. We nicely predicted this time delay using cybernetic model. And so for those who are interested in knowing more about cybernetic model, you can uh, look at the review article on it uh, 2012. Also 2018, we have, a, we have published a book and then Ram Krishna is a leading author for this book. Now, um, with this knowledge on cybernetic model, now I'm, I'm ready to describe the different approaches because you, I assume that you uh, have some good sense of uh, uh, phonetic and other type of modeling, but not necessarily cybernetic modeling. Now, we have to know that modeling is, is just approximation. It's idealization of reality complex systems, but it doesn't have to, or doesn't capture every aspect of reality. So it defines what, what our model wants to uh, need to capture, and then based on that, what we can uh, test our hypothesis. So there are great analogy between uh, human models and the micro, uh, microbial models. I took my picture, uh, I sacrificed myself for science discussion in this case. So. For modeling microorganisms, we may want to have very detailed, like a complete model, a perfect model, so fully dynamic whole cell model. These models are already available for uh, relatively simple organisms. So, but these models are very rare. I mean, sometimes not available, even though this is very attractive and sexy, but you, it may be difficult to find those models a lot, for, particularly for environmental microorganisms. And we even do not know that who they are in many cases. So it's similar to that we have used a very uh, a hand, handsome uh, fashion model, but they do not represent the reality often. And kinetic models uh, often do not account, account for regulation. This is similar to the use of uh, animal models for studying humans. So they, these are useful and these, uh, they show very interesting dynamics. We can understand we, the real system by that, but the scope of prediction is limited to a certain range because the way they respond to perturbation might be very different. So for example, this animal, they sleep and they walk, they eat, very similar to human beings, but their response to perturbations or stimulation may be very different from human beings. Now, cybernetic models, describe regulatory behaviors 
by based on uh, artificial intelligence system modeling. And these are not real cells. And then this is a hypothesis based modeling still useful and depending on how we design how to program their regulatory behaviors to the resulting model can be very useful. And then constraint based model accounts for often the very detailed chemical uh, metabolic structure in the network. And then, but uh, the origin of that is steady state model. So we can, this is very useful. We can, under given conditions, we can look at what happens inside a cell by looking at uh, detailed pathways, very similar to anatomy model for human beings. So um, I'll cover various different approaches for metabolic modeling, including metabolic flux analysis, MFA, and flux balance analysis, and flux variability analysis, and elementary flux mode analysis, and dynamic uh, extension of FBA, and also EMA, uh, it's called the TFV, and then microscopic, microscopic bioreaction model, MBM. And also I talk about simulated modeling approach, their combination with other approaches. And finally, I'll show how they are, they can be connected uh, as a network. And it's challenging to cover all of these of different approaches in one uh, lecture, uh, particularly during the remaining 20 minutes or so, but I'll be using the tutorial toy network uh, then show how they are related and then how uh, I can explain their concepts. So here you can see, first of all, capillaries, extracellular metabolites and the intracellular metabolites represent this nodes in the network. So here, outside the cell, S, biomass, and product, they are extracellular. And then M1 to M4 are intracellular metabolites. And then R1 to R7 are reactions or fluxes. And we can represent these reactions uh, as stoichiometry. So this is called stoichiometric representation of reaction and of network. We can uh, set up dynamic mass balances for intracellular metabolites from M1 to M4. And this small M represents concentration of capital M. Capital M represents their names, but small M represents their uh, concentration. Similarly, small r1 to r7 represent reaction rate or fluxes, but r, capital R1 to r7 represent their names. So you can make, uh, write their mass balances using uh, vector and matrix notation conveniently. And if, if you want to develop, uh, develop very detailed kinetic model by accounting for intracellular dynamics, you may use because we test mental kinetics for individual reactions. For example, R1 here is, uh, depends on the concentration of S, R2, concentration of M1, and so forth. The problem in doing this is that we the model will end up with so many parameters. So R1 has two parameters, small K1 and capital K1. We have R1 to R7, so total number of parameters 14. So, it's difficult to collect data that uh, can accurately determine these parameters all. Therefore, what people do is that they assume steady state for intracellular metabolites. In general, intracellular dynamics are faster than extracellular dynamics. Therefore, we can assume that intracellular metabolites immediately uh, arrives in steady state while extracellular variables keep changing in time. This is called a quasi steady state approximation. On the quasi steady state, then this mass balance is just becomes one, a zero. So here, this is called stoichiometric matrix. Um, in, in the literature, uh, they use uh, capital S, but I have used N because I use the S for uh, substrate. So N R equals zero. This is stoichiometric uh, reaction and at steady state. And the goal here is to determine flux vector from R1 to R7. And but, it, but this is underdetermined the system because we have uh, seven unknowns, but four equations. So we have more unknowns than equations. Therefore, uh, 
the solution is not uniquely determinable. Rather, a solution forms flux cone like that. So it has an infinite number of solutions. They form flux cone in flux space. For example, this is one particular solution that flux here through this pathway then have one, 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 or, okay, so this solution uh, corresponds to a specific node point in flux space on the edge in this case, but there's another solution I can assume, okay, so R1 is two and then there is split and then there is different flux distribution. This is another solution, this in this case, this is one of the point inside the flux cone. So, uh, we don't know which one is true solution. Therefore, we need, well, there are two uh, approaches in solving this issue. We can add more measurement. For example, we can add a flux measurement from C certain MFA. This is the topic that Mark Brockman will talk about after me. And or we can just introduce like hypothesis cell may be maximizing certain objective like flux based the biomass, biomass production. So flux balance analysis, cybernetic modeling, really shares this aspect. So, and MFA, uh, you, you will hear uh, more about MFA from Mark and in greater detail, but uh, this is one slide I, I prepared for that. So MFA, they use a labeled nutrient and they, they, they perform experiments based on labeled carbon and nitrogen. And then they measure how their concentration of different labeling uh, labeled carbons and nitrogen change in time, and they use simple metabolic network model. And uh, typically, this is a moderate size focusing on met central metabolic pathway. And using this dynamic model, they predict the concentration change of this labeled metabolite and compare with experimental data to determine fluxes inside the metabolic network. Once the lack of fit is satisfactory, then we can use that as a like, measured flux, uh, fluxes. And this is useful, and we can use this data uh, to constrain genome scale metabolic matter model. And meaning that our original space is too huge, but it can be significantly reduced to smaller space by adding, this, by adding these constraints. Or we can use this data for validating the FBA prediction later. FBA approach, and as I said, they uh, set up a goal to, for example, typical uh, objective function is maximization of biomass. But if you maximize biomass in this case R5, the solution becomes infinite. Therefore, we have to constrain um, some of the fluxes, typically uptake of flux. Under this range uh, of uh, R1 is uptake rate, then we'll have, uh, we can solve the problem by performing linear programming. And in this case, Maximization of biomass really realized by taking off as along this pathway. Again, uh, this corresponds to one particular solution on the edge, but if you constrain like a different way, that this solution changes along this direction and that. In the yield space, yield space means that we really normalize the fluxes. This, all these three solutions <clears throat> correspond to one single point in the yield space. Also, uh, flux variability analysis is an important concept. Uh, the K-based uh, FBA app also run, in, includes FBA uh, by default. And then to explain that concept, I had to modify a little bit the, the network. And then we have now split of this flux from M0 and M1. By solving MF, FBA, you'll, you can determine all fluxes other than these uh, fluxes. So therefore, after performing FOVA, the question is that how, uh, to what extent individual fluxes determined by FOVA can change. Therefore, as a second step of FOVA, we can solve uh, another linear program pro problem by maximizing and minimizing these individual fluxes. In this case, we maximize, minimize R8 and R9 to get the range of their uh, the flux is in this case zero to one for both cases. Elementary mode analysis is a, a complementary approach. It doesn't perform uh, FBA, rather it, identify, it identifies all skeletal pathway uh, 
core, subs, core set of a pathway that can represent all metabolic uh, pathway inside the network. So in this example, uh, there are three skeletal pathways. First one is pink here and the green and the blue. Why they are important? Because any flux vector can be represented by complex combinations of these three pathways. Each pathway has, pathway has a different biomass yield. We can get the biomass, uh, highest biomass yield from first pathway, EM1, but from EM2 and EM3, their biomass yield low, becomes lower to 0.3 or 0.7. So these three elementary modes or elementary flux modes represent uh, uh, correspond to edge vectors of this flux cone or vertices in, in, in the space. As I said, any feasible solution that's inside this flux cone or this uh, convex hull can be represented by convex combinations of these three uh, pathways. There is a dynamic extension of FBA and then um, because FBA intrinsically steady state model, but we can simulate dynamic uh, variation by modeling uptake rate like using uh, kinetic equations. For example, this is uh, uh, similar to previous example, growth of uh, E. coli on glucose and xylose. And you can see dynamic uh, the regulatory behavior, the glucose consumed first in xylose, uh, followed by xylose consumption. And then to account for this dioxin consumption pattern, then we have to consider the catabolic, catabolite repression by including the suppression of xylose uptake by glucose concentration. So, but this is the part that cybernetic model can take care of well. So uh, this is the three pathways I have shown in the previous slide. And then we model, the, we can model the fluxes through this individual elementary modes. And then we introduce these enzymes and, and then uh, cybernetic variable B here as a control variable. So total uptake rate of substrate S is represented by complex combinations of these three uh, fluxes to individual elementary modes. And these weighting factors are not constant. The enzyme level changes and their control factor, control variables also change in time. Therefore, they represent how these combinations of three elementary modes changes dynamically depending on environmental conditions. So this is an example. And then assume that this is actual uh, flux change along, uh, through three elementary modes in time, uh, depending on uh, time zone, for example, time zone one, elementary mode one is most dominant and this mode will be activated significantly. Time two, time zone two, second elementary mode and time zone three and third elementary mode. But fourth, ele fourth zone and then this one, there's no single mode that is dominant. Therefore, we have to combine them all to represent their uh, activated reaction. So this is an example how this concept works well. So this is the experimental data from PNNL, and this is a gross of Schwannella onidens MR1. So initially from lactate, lactate is the main carbon source in the beginning, but when lactate is depleted, then uh, it, it utilizes pyruvate as an alternative carbon source. And when pyruvate is depleted and acetate is finally used as a carbon source, there, therefore, there is significant metabolic uh, shift in metabolic pathway while the carbon source is switched over from one to another. So there are three pathways from lactate, three phases, lactate consumption phase and pyruvate consumption phase in the acetate consumption phase. Then uh, by performing elementary mode analysis, then uh, we obtained 35,000 elementary mode and 24,000, this is too many elementary modes. Then I uh, really want to handle this uh, complexity by uh, lumping the elementary modes. There are an alternative approach called the lumped cybernetic model, uh, cybernetic, hybrid cybernetic model or LHCM that really based on this lumped elementary model concept. Therefore, we have just three pathways that are obtained from lumped pathways. 
So the prediction can be validated by comparing with C certain MFA result. Then the initial correlation was pretty good, but there are some deviation for certain data. So we incorporate them and to improve the prediction. And this is a dynamic uh, shift their metabolic pathways as the carbon source changes from lactate and a part of it in acetate. Oh, sorry about that. Initially, it consumes lactate, and then you can see that the blue bars below is a metabolic fluxes. Now shifted to pyruvate, different patterns, and the final acetate. It's 9.05. Thank you. So I speed up a little bit, and now, yeah, this is the, um, the second part of my talk, but uh, I intended to uh, go fast because it's representation of the metabolic networks and then using graphically and then also uh, using general mathematical equations. So you may not understand well, just in short uh, time I, I, I can have, but uh, just look at my slides after this then but this is web general representation and depending on how they uh, describe their internal variables, extracellular species, intracellular species, enzymes, and other uh, variables involved in regulation. Oh, and then, so I use these uh, icons to represent different types of a model and then uh, how they uh, describe their metabolic network kinetically or whether using quasi-state state approximation, and then uh, whether they are using convex analysis like elementary mode analysis or flux balance analysis for regulation part, kinetic, they can kinetically dip, uh, describe regulation or cybernetic control laws or other uh, uh, control laws, rule-based control laws, and then uh, static versus uh, dynamic. This long term dynamic model just assume that uh, they do not account for internal structure. So they are called uh, black box model. And the difference is that lump cyber model accounts for their regulation, but kinetic model doesn't. So fully structured model, fully structured dynamic model, and, and has different uh, forms of a model and genetically structured kinetic model uh, Jamie Young extended cybernetic model to both intracellular reactions as extracellular reactions and Young's model. If we remove uh, regulation part from Young's model, it becomes metabolically structured kinetic model. And quasi statistics model very useful, different forms of here. I talked about HCM, hybrid cybernetic model, microscopic bioreaction model, and LHCM, and dynamic FBA and then FBA, dynamic FBA that is combined with regulation part. And so this is a, uh, the so-called metabolic model in the end scale. You can see fully structured model, you can see how they are derived from prototype and then under what assumptions and then a constraint they can reduce to simpler quasi steady state models and then even black box model. And the bottom there, there is a, a black box model, no, not state, state model, but this gray area represent, they don't account for dynamic interaction with the environment. Still, these are useful to understand how metabolic uh, fluxes are activated under given uh, conditions. So this is my last slide for take home message, then which model we have to choose among many. Um, my answer previously was that, so, we need to define our questions to address. Once we define our address, our questions to address, then uh, we can take the model, the simplest model if possible, as possible, that can address the, the, that question. So the information theoretical uh, criteria such as AIC, BIC are very useful for that. So in this example, then we can fit this data using linear model or polynomial model but that's the optimal choice of model can be uh, determined based on this AIC, BIC, uh, where the, these criteria are, these values are minimum. So if we unnecessarily use complicated, complex model, 
then this is similar to the case that we use a sledgehammer to crack a knot. So, but, but for the, to the same question, my answer is a little bit different now. So, we can identify new questions that are critically important but could not be addressable in the past because due to the limitation of our uh, uh, method or the lack of data. But now, summer school really highlight the availability and the utility of, utility of multi-domain data for modeling. So this gives an opportunity to think of an integrative modeling approaches to multi-domain integration. By that, we can increase the size of a problem and then we can challenge it to solve a more uh, bigger science questions and the more challenging problems. So, uh, so you can see that my answer has been changed the previous now from now. Okay, so I, uh, I'll stop here. So, okay, how many times I have for questions? Five minutes. Okay, and yeah, we have about five minutes. I'll give you a couple quick questions from the Zoom chat. So um, one of the questions that came up early was a question about how, how do we address organisms that have synergistic relationships? So if they exchange metabolites or signal one another, how would you address those in a modeling framework? Synergistic relationship among organisms? Yeah, among different organisms within the community, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we need a different approaches for that. I think I have not covered that in this talk, but that is a, a covered in my review article 2014. There are data driven models. So, very short uh, population data and dynamic models can be used for inferring and predicting their interaction. Signal like processing. Modeling is because another type of data in modeling approaches. Your your uh, sound is breaking up a little bit, Jan. I don't know if you changed your speaker position, but um, it was a little hard to hear you there. But here's another question for you: um, for the denitrification example, could you explain more about the potential mechanisms of delay in regulation? Was the cell growing actively? How many generations was the delay? Was it because of slow kinetics of enzyme or product production or degradation? And how widespread is this phenomenon? Well, there might be a very little unbroken. Yeah, still a little bit hard to hear you. Uh, while I'm talking, you can mute yourself. Then it, then it, I don't know. OK. It may not help much, but anyways, so there, there must be multiple uh, mechanism we can use to explain that, but uh, one mechanism we uh, identified that is that there is a process of gene expression and uh, transcription and that is, that is a new source of time delay. Time delay, delay was significant, several days. So that uh, generation time, microbial generation time, hours in environmental conditions that they can be longer though. So there must be any other possibilities to explain that phenomena, but this is a one of them and we think this is a plausible mechanism to explain that. Sorry about if I that uh, broken again. Oh, it was a little better, especially at the end there. Um, here's a question that just came through the text channel. Um, in in Discord, which, if any of these modeling strat strategies can be implemented in cultures and which can be applied to complex microbial communities where we might only be able to hypothesize the main nutrient cycles? I think that uh, this can be implementable for complex microbial communities, but the assumption there is that we um, we may not account for individual, every single uh, organism in the community, but we, we may group them or we can take them as a one uh, supra organism. Uh, for example, still we can apply the metabolic uh, network modeling, flux balance analysis for complicated network. And then 
Of course, there are some uncertainties in the uh, in prediction. Therefore, it, it is important to incorporate omics data to constrain the model and to narrow down the the, the level of uncertainties. Okay, thanks, Yan. So I think we're we're at the end of our time. Um, there's a lot of interest in your presentation, and there's a lot of questions coming through over on Discord. So, if you have a chance, um, as you go go back to Discord, Yan, if you could uh, work through some of those questions over there in the text, that would be great. A um, lot of lot of people expressing appreciation for your presentation. So thank you very much for for giving that to us. Um, we'd like to move on next to um, the next presentation. And this presentation will be given by Mark Borkham. Um, Mark is a computer scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory here in Richland, Washington. And he works on the application of computer science and software engineering techniques to enable and support interdisciplinary research. And I've worked with Mark in the context of some work he did at EMSL. Um, and one of the things he has done uh, in EMSL is develop some tools for flexomics modeling, which he's going to uh, describe in part today. Um, I'd like to note that Mark is also involved in um, the Microbiome Data Collaborative, the National Microbiome Data, Data Collaborative, and has done a variety of different types of applications across a, a diverse set of uh, scientific application spaces. So uh, Mark, are you ready to go? I hope so. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, could someone please confirm that they can see uh, the title slide? I can see your slide and it's in full screen and looks great. Thanks, Mark. Fantastic. All right, let's get going. So, um, hello, my name is Mark Borkham and uh, I'm a computer scientist at PNNL and I'm based in the beautiful Washington State in the Pacific Northwest. And you can see an aerial view of PNNL on the title slide. Um, as Tim mentioned, I'm the computer scientist and I work with the domain experts. And this is one of the really cool things about PNNL. We're a matrix organization. So when you do a project, you work with different people and everyone brings different things to the project. Um, I would say, please uh, direct your questions if they are biology or biochemistry focused to the other panelists. But if they are computer science focused, then please, by all means, direct them to me. And uh, before I get going, just a quick acknowledgement. Thanks to Tim and Nancy, the organizers, a uh, great job. And uh, thanks to Hyun, Chris, and Janica for uh, day three today. I think you're really going to enjoy the narratives that you'll be uh, using this afternoon. So uh, as we mentioned, the quick overview, this is an introductory talk. It's not intended to be a graduate level talk. This is to whet your appetite and to uh, try and entice you to come and work with us at PNNL and at EMSL. We're going to very, very briefly look at flux balance analysis, but I'm going to focus on metabolic flux analysis. And specifically, we're going to look at stable isotope labeling experiments and how we might incorporate that uh, experimental data into our models. So what is metabolic network modeling? You've heard it a lot this week, I'm sure. The goal here is we want to correlate the genome with the molecular physiology. We want to know, can we model the behavior that we observe? And can we make our models really, really good? So what is the model? It's a mathematical representation of the genome. Hyun went into a lot of detail there. We're going to focus on the biochemical reaction network, but uh, as Hyun mentioned, there are a lot of other places that you might want to look at for your model. And we're going to specifically be looking at constraint optimization problems. And uh, for example, you might be looking at maximizing an objective function. And uh, as Hyun mentioned, the standard is to maximize biomass production. And uh, for this talk, we'll be looking at biomass generated by the central carbon metabolism. A little bit of terminology here. Uh, if I use the word biological entity, I'm referring to a cell or an organelle or maybe some fluid. Um, when I'm talking about the metabolome, that's the set of small molecules, so the metabolites. And when we're talking about the fluxome, we're talking about the set of all of the rates of the metabolic reactions within that entity. And you'll see some graphics uh, in subsequent slides, and they're pretty cartoony, but they all follow the same theme. What we've got at the bottom of the slide, there are some compartments. We've got an intracellular compartment with some intracellular metabolites, and uh, we've also got an extracellular compartment with our substrates and our products. And you can see that we have flux, the rate of change of the concentrations of those metabolites, and the amount of flux is being indicated by the thickness of the arrow in this cartoon. So here's our narrative. We're gonna do a fictional experiment we want to study the carbon chemistry of the TCA cycle in some strain of E. coli. And in our imaginary lab, we've got a bioreactor, and a little image there on the right-hand side. 
our protocol is we're going to bring the sub sample up to metabolic steady state. And then we're going to control the substrate uptake rate, we're going to measure it, and we're also going to measure the products that are generated. So how are we going to do that? We're going to model the biochemical reaction network. Here is an example of the reaction network for the TCA cycle. And I've taken this from Antonowicz's paper, and you'll find all the references at the end of the slide deck, and yes, we will be posting the slides uh, as soon as possible. Um, the reason that I'm using this example is you can go to the paper and follow through all of the math that I'm going to allude to in the rest of the talk. So what is a biochemical reaction network from the perspective of a computer scientist? It's a graph. It's a labeled graph. So the edges, which correspond to reactions, and the vertices, which correspond to the molecular species, they're labeled with information. In this case, the names or the identities. Edges are directed, and the graph as a whole is cyclic. There is no restriction on which edges can point to, uh, you know, go from which source vertex to which target vertex. You might want to have, in the case of this example, a reversible reaction being modeled by two directed reactions, and in which case we have a cycle. So you can see uh, on the right hand side, fumarate, FUM, and oxaloacetate, OAC, in the figure. There is V7 and V6, and those are the forwards and backwards directions for this reversible reaction. The other reactions being irreversible in this case. So how do we actually go about writing this stuff down? People tend to write them as uh, reactions in an interesting syntax. And the nice thing about the syntax is we've got these two kinds of variables. There are stoichiometric coefficients. And so these are the things that tell us this, much, this many moles of this thing plus this many moles of that thing gives us this much of that thing. And we can balance on that or do other mathematical techniques as we'll allude to later. And importantly, the stoichiometric coefficients are additive. You add them together. But the reaction coefficients, these rate variables, they're multiplicative. And so in our code, we need to distinguish between them. And this is very important. Let's look at uh, this represented as a matrix. So if you have a graph, you can represent it as an adjacency matrix. And so here we have the rows are the metabolites and the columns are the rates. And you can see that we have for a specific reaction, if you have a substrate, it's got a negative stoichiometric coefficient in this matrix. And if you have a product, it's got a positive stoichiometric coefficient. And so here we've got uh, alpha ketoglutarate going to succinate and a bit of carbon dioxide. And you can see in the column I've highlighted, we have a minus one stoichiometric coefficient for uh, AKG, and then carbon dioxide and succinate both have positive one as their coefficients. And these coefficients don't have to be integral, they can be fractions as well. So flux balance analysis, I'm going to go through this very quickly because Hume gave a great introduction. In general, if you've got M species and N reactions, you have an M by N matrix. And I'm using the capital N syntax from the literature. And then you can compose your rate equation, which combines that matrix with the rate vector and also the concentration vector. And taking the, uh, the rates of change with respect to the time variable T, we get the flux variable vector. And as Hyun mentioned, at st metabolic steady state or a quasi steady state, depending on your terminology, we're equating all of that to be zero. So we're saying that the rates of change of the intracellular metabolites is zero. And then we use constraint optimization, in this case, linear programming. And we might constrain that, as Hyun alluded to, to biomass generation. But there are questions here. What can we constrain? What should we do? What must we constrain? And so this is alluding to rational experiment design. And then how do you actually test that your sample is at metabolic steady state? And as the computer scientist, I'm not going to tell you how you do that. I'm just going to say this is a question that you must consider because the code is always deterministic. It receives numbers and it calculates the answer. So you need to make sure that the numbers you're putting in as inputs are valid. So how do we analyze the reaction network and in advance of actually doing our experiments, glean useful information that would help us to do rational experiments design? One way that you can analyze the network is to take what's called the left null space of the stoichiometry matrix. And in the literature, you'll see this denoted by KER, K-E-R. And what this does is it gives you an object which contains within it the dynamic invariance as what is known in the literature as a convex basis. So they have non-negative uh, coefficients in linear functionals. What this really gives you is a matrix with columns. And each column is a linear functional of your rates. But as a whole, that dynamic invariance concentration does not change over time. 
And this is very, very useful because it allows us to identify all of our rate variables, our fluxes, with either transport between compartments, exchange within a compartment, or variables that are determined by these dynamic invariants. And it's very useful to identify these variables in advance because it means we can choose the correct substrate to help us best understand how those variables are playing out in our model. Another important thing to know is whenever you have a forward backward pair of reversible reactions, you're gonna induce one of these dynamic invariants. So every reversible reaction, and by the way, all reactions are in principle reversible, are adding one of these dynamic invariants to your model, which you would then have to solve for. As Hyun mentioned, the geometry of this space is a, it's a complex polyhedron, which we call the flux cone. And the surface rays of that flux cone characterize the behavior at steady state. In the, some literature, they call this the extreme pathways. There are lots of different names for these things. And I've given the reference there. So we can take the kernel of our stoichiometry matrix. Oh, no, we can't. We get an error. And the reason that we get an error, it says the stoichiometry matrix must be a full rank. What does that actually mean in terms of the, the biochemistry that's going on here? So if we look at our reaction network, you can see that there are two instances of carbon dioxide that occur in the intracellular compartment. And the matrix isn't full rank because that carbon dioxide, those two carbon dioxide things are actually the same thing, but their concentration and their flux is not flowing into a single variable. And so what we're then doing here is we're adding in an extracellular compartment and we're putting in, you can see we've got ASP underscore EXT, so aspartate has an extracellular corresponding uh, metabolite, the same thing for acetyl-CoA and also for our products. And then we're also introducing B1 through B4. And these are additional rate variables, but what this is doing, if you look on the left-hand side now, you can see in the top left quadrant, we have the original stoichiometry matrix. And then in the top right quadrant, we now have the stoichiometry for the exchange and transport from the extracellular to the intracellular compartment and back again. So if we take the top half of this matrix now, oh, I should actually say in this slide, just to quickly say, um, those variables as well, B1 through 4, these are actual variables that you can measure in your lab. So they correspond directly to your substrate uptake and your product generation rates. Uh, for this example, it's a little naive. You wouldn't necessarily be uh, measuring glutamate. You might want to be looking at biomass, but uh, I just thought I'd add the variables and the names of the extracellular metabolites to the figure. Anyways, now, using the top two uh, quadrants, we now can take the kernel of our stoichiometry matrix. And if we look on the right-hand side of this equation, we can see, well, we've got three dynamic invariants. So if we look at these, let's see what we can see here. So U1, U2, and U3 are our dynamic invariants. They look pretty complicated, or at least U1 and U2 have a, a lot of non-zero coefficients. That's quite interesting. U3, on the other hand, that's only got two non-zero coefficients. So there's something up with that. We're going to investigate that in a second. Let's look at the first row of the matrix on the right-hand side of that equation, V1. So we can see it's a linear combination of our dynamic invariants. And in this case, V1 is exactly equal to U1. And the same for V2. If we go down to the third row, we can see that V3 is equal to U2. But then when we get to V4, we can see that it's actually one instance of U1 minus one instance of U2. So V4 is a linear functional of our dynamic invariants, but V1, 2, and 3 are not. Now, other things that we can do with this, uh, this matrix on the right-hand side is we can subtract rows from each other, and we can also subtract columns from each other. Uh, this is actually really useful. Suppose that we subtract the row for V7 from the row for V6. And remember, these correspond to the forwards and backwards directions of our reversible reaction between oxaloacetate and fumarate. Well, now we can see the net flux for that reaction. And we can see that it's exactly equal to one unit of U1 minus one unit of U2. So we've already learned something about the behavior of our network. We haven't even had to do an experiment yet. We've just done this from our model. Now, as Hyun mentioned, whether or not our model actually describes reality in an adequate way is something that we then want to validate by experiment. So we go through our right-hand matrix and we can then characterize all of our original variables according to the dynamic invariants. 
and you can see that I've done this for the transport variables and the exchange variables, and then B3, V4, V5, and V6, they we found to be linear functionals of the dynamic invariants. And as I mentioned before, we can calculate the net rates for our reversible reactions. So the forwards rate minus the backwards rate, and we can see that it is also a linear functional of the dynamic invariants. So now let's put all that on our model graph. This is quite interesting. So we now know we can see U1 and U2, we can determine those by experiment. We know exactly what we're putting into the model as substrate. And then on the bottom right-hand side of the figure, we can see that uh, glutamate, when it's transported, that is apparently equal to U2. So in our experiment, if we're controlling aspartate, if we measure the product generation rate for glutamate, we can test whether or not those two are equal. And when we find that they are equal, then we have another piece of evidence that suggests that we might be at metabolic steady state. So rational design of our experiment is completely informed in this case by the stoichiometry matrix representation of the biochemical reaction network. But this still begs the question, how do we determine this U3? So suppose that I set U1 to equal 100 and U2 to equal 50, just arbitrary numbers here. Um, they, the fluxes do have uh, units, but as I mentioned, our, our flux variables are multiplicative. So if you're, if you're writing down the dimensional analysis, you are multiplying these values, these scalars, 150 and so on, by the coefficient for the unit. So in principle, because we have a, a linear equation here, all of these numbers are dimensionless unless you actually multiply them with a unit, you know, millimolar per gram dry weight uh, per hour. Um, so interestingly here though, you can see if we look uh, towards the middle oxaloacetate and fumarate, we can see that in the forwards direction, it's the, the flux is always whatever dynamic invariant U3 is plus 50. So that's pretty cool. So we've got this, uh, the flux cone that was mentioned before. Uh, it looks like in this case, if we set U1 and U2, it's more of a flux valley. And uh, the valley's uh, kind of width is 50 units of flux. And so uh, that's an interesting thing that we've been able to glean just by knowing the substrate uptake rates. We've now found that we only really have to fit one variable. And in fact, what's interesting here is we don't necessarily have to fit that variable in order to get uh, useful results. We can still measure glutamate and carbon dioxide, and I'll give you some uh, examples of experimental techniques that you might want to use. But should we want to know the complete fluxome of this uh, biological entity, then we need to apply a kind of higher level technique in order to determine U3. There are some other considerations as well. And before I go into the topic of metabolic flux analysis, I just want to point out a few things that uh, as a programmer, I have to consider, and these are issues that I would then raise with the domain experts. The choice of objective function is very, very significant. Typically, people choose to maximize biomass formation from the central carbon metabolism. And the way that they do that is they specify a biochemical reaction that involves almost all of the carbon metabolites in their system with, typically, they are fractional coefficients. And uh, there can be a lot of uh, uh, substances featured in this reaction. It's very, very complicated. And it's complicated in the sense that it is, uh, the system is sensitive to the stoichiometric coefficients in that equation. Now, the question that you need to ask yourself is, what is the provenance of those stoichiometric coefficients? Where do they come from? So suppose that you're working with E. coli. Which strain of E. coli was used in the experiment from which those stoichiometric coefficients were determined? Are those stoichiometric coefficients actually suitable for the strain of E. coli that you are working with. Now, typically, if you go into a GitHub or you see a paper, um, people will have copied and pasted and copied and pasted and copied and pasted these things. And when you track it all the way back to the source, you find that it's a book by Neidhart from 1987. And the reference to the book is at the end of the slide deck. Um, if you want to read about this in more detail, uh, besides getting the book, which is excellent, um, there's a great paper by Pramanik from 1997 where they go into the math very, very deeply and uh, explain the relationship between the stoichiometric coefficients that are determined and the resulting activity in your simulated model. So just something to consider 
when working at the genome scale. Right, so let's take stock. We're about halfway through, so let's look at our narrative. So our goal was to study the central carbon metabolism, looking specifically at the TCA cycle in E. coli. We've got our bioreactor, and we now know what's going in and out of it, and we have variables that we can set so that when we collect that data in our experiment, we can incorporate it into our model runs. And our protocol at the moment is the same, but what we found is that if we limit ourselves to flux balance analysis only, we don't necessarily know the intracellular flux for the reversible reaction between fumarate and oxaloacetate. And if you recall, that's dynamic invariant U3. But we're making progress. We haven't actually done a single uh, experiment in the quote unquote lab yet, but we've learned a lot about the system just from the model. So let's see how much further we can go. Metabolic flux analysis. The goal here is we're going to label our substrates. And we're going to label the substrates by swapping out specific atoms. We're going to swap those atoms with isotopic variants. And these are variants that hopefully we can detect by experiment. And the reason that we do that is because with an enhanced model, and I'm going to show you what that looks like, we can then track the movements of those isotopic atoms through the reaction network. And if we then do the right experiments and take the right measurements, we can use that to understand the intracellular flux. Now, there are many, many, many techniques that you can use to obtain this data. We're going to focus on mass spectrometry and the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy in this talk. And uh, the reason for that is we have wonderful, wonderful instruments and scientists at EMSL for these two instrumentations, and we would love for you to come and work with us. So let's talk a little bit about metabolic flux analysis and nomenclature. We're going to talk about moieties. Now, a moiety is just a set of atoms. We don't care what those atoms are actually for. They might be one carbon atom from carbon dioxide, or it might be a bunch of carbon atoms for something else. But as far as we're concerned, it's just a set of atoms. And importantly, there are n of them. And we can label each atom, or index it to be more formal, from 1 to n. Now, then the next variable, the next uh, kind of hyperparameter, one might even say, uh, in our model is the excess neutron count. So I mentioned that we're going to swap things out with their isotopic variants. When you have, for example, carbon-12, one of its isotopic variants would be carbon-13, and in which case we've added a neutron. So the neutron excess would be plus one. And it's important to know what n and m are in advance because it tells us how many possible variables we'll have in our model. Once we've done that, there are combinatorial objects that we can construct. The first one is called the isotopic isomer, or the isotopomer. It's a brilliant name, really rolls off the tongue. And you can see them on the top right-hand side. And these are all of the possible combinations given the isotopic atoms that one could use in, in this case, the carbon skeleton of a molecule. And so you can see the first one is carbon-12, carbon-12, and subsequently carbon-12. And then the second one is carbon-13, followed by all carbon-12s. The third one is a carbon-12 atom, followed by carbon-13, followed by all carbon-12. And if we run all the way down the list, eventually we get to all carbon-13. Now, what I've also done on the right-hand side is I've written the total number of excess neutrons in that isotopomer. And you can see that some isotopomers have the same number of excess neutrons. And this is very important because what it means is when you take, for example, a mass spectrum and you're looking at the mass to charge ratio, you may see that a single peak is contributed to by more than one isotopomer. And it's important to understand that. The next combinatorial object that we can construct is called a cumulative isotopomer or a cumomer. And the idea here is that you imagine that there is an any state. There is a labeling state that can represent any possible labeling. In this case, it could be carbon-12, but it could also be carbon-13. This lets you take what are called logical disjunctions. Now, by doing that, you can, in principle, calculate some interesting um, numbers from your experimental data. 
What I'm going to show you, however, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, I'm going to give you a reference instead. Um, what I'm going to show you, though, is that humimers are actually elements of an even more general combinatorial object. And the last combinatorial object that you see in the literature are these mass isotopomers. As I mentioned, the m plus some number, those things are your mass isotopomers. So we're looking at give me all of the isotopomers of this moiety where the excess neutron count is the same. Now, what you find with all these combinatorial objects, and there are others, uh, given an example, uh, the number of atoms is another good example, um, they are all what's called a monoid, which is a mathematical object from category theory. And what you find is there is a monoid homomorphism between the representation of the moiety and the representation of the isotopic combinatorial object. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm going to give you a reference instead. But what's important here is the cardinality of that set is entirely determined by the variables n and m. And that because it's a monoid, there is always an identity element. So for example, if you're used to uh, addition, the ad identity element would be zero, because if you add zero to something, you get the original thing that you started with. Similarly, if you're used to regular multiplication of numbers, real numbers, then one would be the identity. And so we've got four monoids here that I've listed. There are more. Um, they all have an identity element which corresponds to the empty moiety of zero atoms and the multiplication element. And then there are also additional constraints. One, one finds that the isotopomer fraction vector, when represented as a vector, uh, it must be stochastic. When one does the same thing for humimers, because we're taking power sets for various technical reasons, the system must be stochastic, but uh, it must sum to uh, 2n, which is, you know, there are 2n elements of a power set of a set. And so if each vector for each of those elements of the power set must sum to 1, then the total sum for the sum of all the power sets must be 2n. And similarly, the vector for mass isotopomer fractions must also be stochastic. Now, I'm going to show you examples of all of these later on in the talk. You can actually transform between them. And uh, because they're all represented as matrices, there are other matrices that give us transforms between those different spaces. Um, what's interesting, though, is that not all of the transforms are reversible. So let's have a look at some experimental data. Here I'm using T to indicate the any state for humimers. And so you can see on the right-hand side, we've got one. So that's the first carbon atom of this moiety. And either we're talking about the any state or specifically we're talking about carbon 12 or it's carbon 13. And underneath that, you can see I've done the same thing for the moiety of the second atom only. But now we have the moiety of the first and second atoms. That's on the far right hand side. And so you can see we have all of the combinations for carbon 12 and carbon 13, but we also have these any placeholders. And that's important and I'll show you why later on. A Little bit about notation. You'll see that I'm writing the name of the moiety, in this case A, followed by a slash, followed by the total number of atoms. And then in curly braces next to it, I've written the atom IDs, separated by commas. Um, the reason for that is you might have more than nine atoms, in which case you don't want to write uh, the shorthand because you would not be able to distinguish 10 from 1 and 0. Um, the shorthand, though, is quite useful because we've got limited space on some slides, so I will be using it as well. Um, note the power set of atoms, so if we have two carbon atoms, the power set contains the empty set, and then the set of one, the set of atom two, and the set that contains atoms one and two. Now in principle, if we had all of these different moieties and we put it into, let's just say for the sake of argument, a GCMS, we might be able to measure the mass fractions. Now the m plus zero, so if we have an empty moiety, the m plus zero, so we're adding no excess neutrons to a moiety of zero atoms, well, the probability of finding that is always going to be one. So we'll just have a single peak there. But when we look at the A2, and then in brackets one, so the first atom of the, the A moiety, you can see that it's m plus zero fraction, the light blue in this figure, is coming from the carbon 12 atom, and then the m plus one is coming from the carbon 13 atom. And similarly for the second carbon atom of moiety A. But then when we're looking at the combination of one and two, for m zero, that's yellow, we can see that that is getting its, uh, its kind of value, its intensity, 
from carbon 12 and carbon 12. And for M plus 2, we can see at the very bottom right of the figure, it's carbon 13 and carbon 13. But for M plus 1, we have to take the sum of the intensity when we have carbon 13 as the first atom, but carbon 12 as the second. And then vice versa, we also have to include the intensity when the first carbon atom is carbon 12, and it's the second carbon atom that is labeled. Now, you can see that this only becomes more complicated as you increase the number of atoms in your moiety, which is why you want to have software do this for you. Now, let's look at other experimental data. Suppose that we want to do this with nuclear magnetic resonance. There is a, a nice result. Uh, essentially, you're applying Bayes' rule. And what it lets you do for certain types of high dimensional experiments, one can write expressions. Typically, they are ratios. And those are ratios of the isotopema fractions that one obtains. And one fits to those ratios. And there is a technique for doing this. Um, I've got an example here for a 2 detoxy HSQC experiment uh, for glutamate. And what you're doing is observing one atom and detecting another atom, carbon in this case, but uh, we are not limited to homonuclear isotopic labeling experiments. One could do heteronuclear experiments as well, for example, carbon nitrogen. And once we've done that, we get an expression for our observe and detect atoms, and we combine that according to Bayes' rule, and we get as a result an expression for the intensity that we expect for that peak. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see I've got the glutamate uh, drawn there, and I've labeled the atoms according to the IUPAC numbering convention. And uh, you'll see that the first carbon atom labeled one is on the right hand side. That's because the IUPAC uh, convention is to start at the carboxyl carbon. And uh, on the right hand side of the screen, you'll also see I've just got a little bit about the Toxy HSQC. Uh, this is quite interesting because the observe and detect uh, maps very, very nicely to the experimental protocol. Right, so we now know that we've got this uh, kind of higher level combinatorial object space. We can measure things in principle with mass spec and with NMR. How do we actually know where things are and then what to measure? And I'm going to cover this hopefully in 10 minutes. So we started originally with uh, stoichiometric coefficients relating all of our moieties, or at least in that case, they were molecular species. Now we're talking about individual moieties and we're tracking the atoms individually. So all our stoichiometric coefficients are one, at least for the isotopically labeled things in our model. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm using a shorthand. A, B, C, D is shorthand for curly braces, A, comma, B, comma, C, etc. And the reason I'm doing this is to save a little bit of space. You can see if we look at what each of these atom transition reactions, what they're telling us now is we have a particular moiety. It consists of some isotopic atoms. And those atoms start on the left-hand side, and they transition to the right-hand side. And if you look at V1, the first row in this table, you can see that we're starting with oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. And the ordering of those atoms in citrate is not necessarily A, B, C, D, E, F. It's D, C, B, F, E, A in this case. To make things even more complicated, you may have uh, moieties that have stereochemistry. For example, uh, succinate and fumarate, uh, they have rotational isomers. Now, we can account for that by having a probability associated with each ordering of atoms. So if you look at V5, you'll see that succinate, there's a 50% chance of observing A, B, C, D, and a 50% chance of observing D, C, B, A. And similarly for fumarate. Now, this is very, very important when you are attempting to incorporate NMR measurements into your models. Um, I should also say the mixing probabilities, they must sum to one. They don't have to be 50% or 100%, they can be arbitrary positive probabilities as long as the total is stochastic. So here's a particular example. We have alpha ketoglutarate, or glutamate even, and uh, it's going to succinate and carbon dioxide. And you can see because we've labeled our atoms, we can track where those atoms go. And uh, here's just an example of how we compute all of the atom transitions for things that involve uh, mixing probabilities. So we're starting with the original syntax. And then what we do is we're distributing. So we're taking, it's just like when you multiply out, uh, when you've got things inside of parentheses, 
you're multiplying each thing with every other thing. It's a Cartesian product. When we take that Cartesian product, we are multiplying our probabilities. And so you can see we start on the left-hand side, there are four possible ways of combining two things on the left with two things on the right. And if we take our atom uh, labels, in this case, A, B, C, D, and we index them, so we just count one, two, three, four, and we track them that way, um, we can see that uh, the first and the last possible uh, combinations, they are actually identical, and the second and third are also identical. This means that we can sum those mixing probabilities. So we started with a fairly complicated uh, biochemical reaction where the probabilities were inside of the description of the atom labelings. And now we've moved that probability out onto the flux, the flux variable. So what we've done is quite literally distributed to functors to use the category theory parlance. So you go ahead and you do this for your entire reaction network. And here's the result. And you can see we've got a lot more reactions than we started with. We started with eight, and now we have 11. And in fact, once we add in our extracellular compartment, we're going to have even more reactions. This isn't a problem uh, in practice now. So now we can start thinking about rational experiment design. What I've done here is I've plotted as a graph all of the isotopic atoms in the model, and I've related them by the flux variables as shown in the stoichiometry matrix. And so you can see if we're starting, for example, let's start on the left-hand side, we have aspartate four, and it's the fourth atom, and we can trace it down by V8, and it goes to oxaloacetate, again, the fourth atom. And then things get a little bit messy. But this is actually really, really useful because we can do rational design. We can ask the question, which atoms of the substrate should be labeled? And we can ask that question by looking at which atoms of the intracellular metabolites will subsequently be labeled. And that might motivate the instrumentation that we choose. Here's another way of looking at that information. What I've done here is I've grouped the atoms together by their moiety. And I'm showing exactly the same edges, but this is a little bit more clear um, for uh, situations where you genuinely want to see the behavior in the context of the moiety as a whole and not for the atoms individually. So now we can ask the question, okay, let's suppose we're going to go to the shop and buy some uh, acetyl-CoA. Which labelings of acetyl-CoA should I purchase? And uh, this is a very important question because budgetary constraints are really quite uh, important when you're planning an experiment. You want to make sure you're buying the right labelings but also you want to make sure that you're able to purchase those labelings. Perhaps you don't need 100% uniform carbon-13 label, you know, to six degrees of precision, 99.99999% label. Um, maybe you can't afford it. So let's just ask the question through elementary graph theory, in this case, reachability analysis, if I label atom one of acetyl-CoA, or if I label atom two, which isotopic atoms are subsequently uh, labeled in my model? And you can see that the results are dramatically different. So if we only label the first carbon of acetyl-CoA, we find that uh, carbons two, three, and four of citrate will never receive any labeling. And uh, similarly for glutamate, if we track all the way through, we can see that two, three, and four of glutamate will never receive any labeling. But on the right-hand side, if we purchase uh, C2 labeled acetyl-CoA, well, now we can actually detect labeling at carbons two, three, and four of glutamate. And in fact, if you were designing an experiment, you may want to mix your labeling. That will give you a really complex result that will really, really help you uh, to fit the data into your model, or the model to your data, I should say. Right, so here's our narrative so far. Another quick recap. So our goal was to study the TCA cycle, and now we're using carbon-13 labeled substrate. We're going to bring our sample up to isotopic steady state as well and we're going to control our labeling and measure the labeled output. And we're also going to take samples, perhaps of the exudate, and we're going to analyze them using mass spec and NMR. How do we do that? We do that with a technique called elementary metabolite units. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm going to give you a reference instead. The idea here is we take our atom transition reaction network, we represent it as a graph, and we do more graph theory on that graph. And 
the graph theory that we're actually doing is we are merging lots of smaller graphs into a bigger one. We're looking for vertices that are reachable with respect to other vertices. So we're looking for sinks in our graph, which correspond to products, where the labeled isotopic atoms can flow all the way from these sources, the substrates in our product. And then we're reducing the number of variables further using a, a one in one out edges counting approach. Uh, all of this is in the Antonowicz paper that is referenced here. The output of all of that is a system of linear equations that one does uh, constraint optimization upon. So you're minimizing the error with respect to a cascade system. So one goes ahead and does this. Uh, here is the example for applicable glutamate. And uh, what you have are reactions that involve a given number of isotopic atoms. In the literature, they refer to this as EMU size. So we have five isotopic atoms in this case, and so there will be EMU reactions from sizes one to five. And you can see for size one, we're tracking the individual atom transitions, but for size two, we're now tracking two isotopic atoms at a time, then three, then four, then five, then N, and so on. So we do all of this, and again, we can plot all of this as a graph, but now our vertices are these moieties, and moieties of moieties, and combinations of moieties and moieties, and so on but we can plot it as a graph and do some more experiment design. So let's see what happens if we label acetyl-CoA's second carbon atom. Well, now we can see how that labeling is flowing through all of our moieties. If we do this contraction operation that I mentioned, you can see that the graph is a little bit smaller, which is great because the adjacency matrix representation of this graph will have less rows and columns, which means that uh, any mathematical operations that we choose to do will be less computationally intensive. Again, let's label that carbon atom, and we can see how the isotopic label is traveling through the network. So EMUs, just to kind of recap here, um, it was still at quasi-steady state. We're still uh, doing all of this with respect to an objective function, as we would have done with FBA, but we're now also adding constraints to minimize the error from our measured value against expressions of these combinatorial objects. So just to, finish, just to finish up the talk, so now what we have, the experimental data, I mentioned that you might want to vary your labeling. So here we have 50% of natural abundance, but then we're using 50% C, or 25%, sorry, C2 label and 25% uniform label. And our aspartate is a completely natural abundance. And then we might go ahead and do some gas chromatography mass spec. And here I've done the headspace gas. Again, this is all fictional. Um, so we've got uh, the mass isotopomer fraction vector for carbon dioxide, the extracellular carbon dioxide. And then we also have GCMS of glutamate. And we have GCMS of our intracellular metabolites. Now, notice that we've been able to, in our fictional experiment, associate our peaks with the moieties of the molecular species. So for example, the first row is fumarate has four carbon atoms in total, but we're only considering the moiety of one of those carbon atoms. Now, whether or not this is reflective of reality, we can uh, debate over a drink, but uh, this is an example of experimental data and how one might incorporate it into a model. Next, we might do some NMR experimental data. So I mentioned we might take the exudate. So here I've done this fictional toxi HSQC on the, the extracellular metabolite glutamate, and we've got a bunch of numbers here. These would come from the NMR spectrum. We put all of that in, and lo and behold, the number is 75. This is good because it reflects the number that you would find in the original figure in the paper. So what we've done now is starting with just a description of uh, the biochemical reaction network. We went as far as we could with flux balance analysis, and we decided to apply metabolic flux analysis with a rational experiment design. And as you saw, MFA allows us to elucidate both the intracellular and extracellular metabolic fluxes. So just to wrap up here, um, I mentioned, please come and join us at EMSL. Uh, you'll find the link there in the bottom corner. And um, one thing that they might not have told you is we do have the guest house. So uh, when you come and work with us, uh, there's a place where you can stay. Um, the interesting thing about fluxomics, EMSL is currently dis defining itself based on science areas, areas that we are really interested in. Fluxomics spans both of those science areas. So if you want to come and work with us to do fluxomics, your proposal has a really good chance of being selected. And then the last thing on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the user facility has a whole suite of capabilities. And with that, I will say thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, Mark. Um, that was that was amazing. Actually, um, I really learned a lot from from your presentation. So I appreciate that. And you know, being able to add to flux balance analysis and other methods, the ability to directly measure some of these fluxes through isotopic labeling and metabolic flux analysis is super powerful. Um, so thanks very much for the talk. Um, one of the things we're, we're getting from, <laughs> I think one of the questions that came through is, is that the talk was super, people really enjoyed it, but there's a huge amount of information um, presented for, especially for people for who this might be their first exposure to metabolic flux analysis. So I'm wondering if you might provide, um, and maybe the easiest way to do this is to go over to the um, Discord channel and provide maybe a key textbook or one or two key links that people could follow up to. I know you're going to provide, you know, a more detailed list of, of uh, references, but if you could um, give that to the people, that might be something that would be really helpful. Um, and then uh, one of the things that I was going to ask, and this just came up in the in the Zoom chat also, is are these tools publicly available? And in particular, is there any uh, relationship to KBase or either current or future? That's a really great question. Um, just to address the first comment, yes, I will put, uh, I'm looking at the books right now, so I'll put the citations for those into the metabolic modeling channel. Great. And then uh, the tools. So. Um, the answer at the moment is yes and no. Um, Fluxomics at PNNL has a very long and deep relationship with KBase. And uh, we've been talking for a long time about putting metabolic flux analysis tooling into the KBase. The question at the moment to be discussed, uh, well, there, actually there are two of them. The first one is to what extent do we put the modeling tooling into KBase versus the visualization and rational experiment design tooling? And then the other question is who pays for the work? Um, we have a lot of codes that we are in the process of open sourcing. And once that is done, we, there is a nominal step to wrap those codes up as KBase apps. So once we've open sourced our codes, um, we would probably go through PNNL's internal proposal system to get that funding. But we would also be very open to an open source project if someone would like to work with us to uh, wrap that code up as an app on our behalf. Great. Excellent. Um, we're, we're a little over time, but I'm going to hit one more question from the Zoom chat and then some other questions. Mark, if you want to head over to, to uh, Discord and chat on some of the other questions that have come up. But what, did, what, is the, um, what are considerations around isotopic fractionation in terms of, uh, in terms of fluxomics? So that's definitely one for the experimentalists. From a computer scientist standpoint, which is uh, really the only a valid answer I can give you. Um, the most important thing in your code is to be able to identify, and by identify I mean be able to set, read and set a value of a variable. And so when I talk about these combinatorial objects, the code that I write, my software, has to be able to identify all of those different combinatorial objects and all of their things that are within them and the associated variables. That way, whatever the experimentalists do come up with, we can at least attempt to accommodate in the code. But uh, I can't answer that question from an experimentalist standpoint. Okay, great. Sounds good. So um, we're going to give folks a little bit of a break here. We have uh, our next talk coming up in just under 15 minutes. Um, we'll be moving into a little bit more of a tutorial style, I think, for the next two talks with some of the folks from KBase. So we're excited to, to get into some of the tools and see how we can do some of these things in practice. Um, we're not leaving Zoom, so we're going to keep the Zoom channel open, uh, but you're welcome to head over um, for a little bit of chat in Discord for the next uh, 12 or so minutes until we start up again at 1015 Pacific time. And um, also, if you need to grab some coffee or whatever, take a break, and um, please join us back again here at 10.15, which is now 11 minutes from now. So we'll see you, see you back soon. Thanks again to Hian and Mark for great talks this morning. Thanks for joining us for the second part of this morning's session. So we heard a lot about some of the background theory and mathematics underlying metabolic modeling from our first two speakers this morning. And now we're going to move uh, towards a little bit more of the applied, um, how to use the applications 
that implement these tools in KBase. And we're going to be hearing from Janika Edrisinge. Am I saying that even close to right, hopefully? And Chris Henry. Um, both Janika and Chris are from the Argonne National Laboratory, which is near Chicago. And, um, and they work in the bioinformatics group there and are very involved in the K-based development. So the first speaker is Janika, and I'm going to let him take it away. Thank you, Tim, for the uh, kind introduction. And um, everybody can hear me, uh, I guess. And um, so I'm a computational biologist at Argonne. And uh, today, so uh, I'm going to talk about the, the microbiome modeling pipeline in KBase and um, how it's uh, address important scientific questions uh, using these tools. So before I uh, begin my presentation, I want to acknowledge the today's TAs uh, that uh, help uh, students during the hands-on session. And um, so please utilize uh, these workflows and uh, ask questions and learn at the end of the day uh, so you can help your projects. So um, to properly orient everyone here from day one, what we have done is we had samples and we had uh, sequencing reads from the samples and we have used apps like FastQC the, to assess the quality and then we trim reads to remove the adapter sequences and then we use tools like Caillou which, work, which works on reads to um, for uh, profiling uh, taxonomic classification. And then we used assemblers like Megahit to assemble these reads into Contig, which we call the metagenome assembly. And then we used Bina, like Metabat2 or MaxBin2, so that we can bin these Contigs in, into individual bins. And then we used the quality assessment tools like CheckM to assess the quality of the bins. And um, once we select the high quality bins, then we can infer uh, genome annotations. We can make inferences to those sequences, identifying genes, the functions that we are, that's where we use tools like DRAM and the uh, GTBB. So for today's workflows, we'll start uh, from the uh, metagenome assembly and also bins. So, uh, the to date workflow consists of that we use the metagenome assembly and then uh, we annotate this metagenome assembly uh, using RAST annotation pipeline in KBase. And similarly, we also uh, annotate these bins that identified from this uh, sample and then annotate with the RAST annotation pipeline. And then, followed by, we are making a metagenome metabolic model. That, uh, that's derived from the annotation that was on this metagenome and the, the tool that we use for the build metagenome metabolic model. And similarly, we'll make individual models for these, for these bins. So once we have a draft metabolic models that was derived from genome annotations, and then we, uh, we need to fill metabolic holes in these metabolic models. So this is the case um, even for uh, organisms, model organisms like E. coli that uh, I heard from other talks like, you know, 30 to 40% of E. coli, e. coli have uh, hypothetical genes that we don't know the function of these genes. So there are knowledge gaps and we need to fill these knowledge gaps uh, with uh, reactions. And so that's where the, the gap filling process comes in. And once we uh, gap filled a metabolic model, then that model is ready for uh, simulation. So we can do our predictions and then we run flux balance analysis on these models. And then uh, finally we compare our metagenome model to its bins. And this is a very rich analysis that you can get out of the system right now, how, um, we compare the, the whole, the entire metabolism of a metagenome and how it's distributed across all the bins. So that's the workflow today in a nutshell. And to, um, to orient yourself uh, and in the context of uh, KBS apps. So um, what are the metabolic models, what they do? Uh, so the metabolic models predicting, uh, metabolic models enable the rapid prediction of the metabolic capabilities of an organisms with the added advantage 
of being scalable with the amount of data that is scalable, that is available of the organism. So we have these organisms systems and we have these sequencing reads and then we derive annotations from this uh, sequencing reads. Uh, so the annotations means that we identify genes, we assign functions, and then based on those functions, we derive biochemical reactions. So uh, very high level overview that you have heard the talks in this morning in very in-depth uh, knowledge, in-depth detail about metabolic model, but very high level overview of what what you see in a metabolic model for those who are less familiar with this concept, that would, I would explain the metabolic model have uh, primarily three components that you have a metabolic network, of course, with the, that com uh, the consist of compounds and reactions. And then uh, we have a biomass that what, this is what the cell is made of, uh, that consists of cell wall materials, energy, cofactors, lipids, and nucleic acids, amino acids, things like that. And this uh, typically this, the biomass is experimentally derived in metabolic models. And, um, and then the third component is of course, um, a media formulation. So th this is the, uh, the um, light glucose minimal media. And uh, typically in the biomass, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, known as the objective function because we measure the growth of, of a model. So you have heard uh, talks in this morning about the, bio, the concept of biomass. So the objective function of a model doesn't have to be, always doesn't have to be the biomass. It could be an excretion reaction that uh, somebody could optimize the excretion of acetate or ethanol or another uh, biofuel. But typically people want to measure growth. So that's why the biomass uh, is uh, considered a, um, typical uh, objective function. So uh, why we, we use metabolic models, what can the metabolic models do? So the metabolic models is one of the great tools to uh, understand the metabolism of an organism. Uh, and you can use the metabolic models to identify trophic interaction among organisms in a system, predict impact of genetic perturbations, identify uh, media requirements in non-culturable bacteria. So there are bacteria that uh, you cannot grow on experimental conditions in a laboratory and uh, metabolic models can help identify what's the minimal uh, list of nutrients that you need, you have to have to grow these organisms. And uh, in the biofuel field, can uh, a certain organism can be used to produce an important biofuel uh, so also you can use this, uh, can use metabolic models to predict cult culture conditions and possible responses to environmental changes. There are, there are endless lists and uh, th these are some of the highlights that, uh, that I can put here to uh, how metabolic models can be used. So we can, uh, we have to optimize predictions. So the, in order to optimize these predictions, the uh, phenotypic data are essential. So uh, the phenotypic data the, means that more measurements need to be reconciled into metabolic models. And uh, so like the, the metabolomics, so the, there's a very exciting talk right after this one, how we can use the cheminformatics uh, where we expand the known biochemistry in uh, generating novel compounds and then map uh, these uh, metabolomic uh, to into the metabolomics data and identify these unknown uh, peaks in metabolomics data and map to those uh, compounds. Remember now, you have heard uh, yesterday and day before the FTICR data is, is a very high quality metabolomics data, but it has just the formula, not the structure. So what we are trying is to map these FTICR data into a, a potential a new chemical structure if that, if that uh, particular compound is not known. So very exciting talk coming after right after this uh, and uh, from Chris Henry. So I uh, look forward to that. And um, the more the measurements we have, the more the measurements that uh, we can integrate like from transcriptomic proteomics and from growth phenotypic data, the predictions will be more useful and more meaningful. So the, so the metagenome model versus bin models concepts. So as I explained earlier, so why, why these are important. Uh, 
So in a metagenome model now, uh, we need to understand, so the metagenome model can, uh, consists of the overall metabolism in the system. So we can answer scientific questions like what are the degradation pathways in this system? What anaerobic electron excitors that uh, this system able to, or capable of reducing? Can the system capable of fixing carbon? Can we identify pathways related to methagenesis or methanotrophic behavior? So when you go to individual uh, bin models, so these are just, uh, these are uh, like isolate uh, organisms, uh, genome scale models. So in the, in once we have these bins, then we can answer questions. We can address questions like, what are the trophic interactions? What, what are the cross-feeding events? So in a typical system, one could fix carbon dioxide and excrete acetate and another organism can use acetate as the carbon source. We can see these relationships when we have, uh, when we model these individual bin organisms and <clears throat> the relative abundance of each member and their contribution in the system. So those, those all those can be factored uh, using the bin models. So this is also important that uh, I have, uh, I got this uh, numbers from, um, from Wrighton group that there is also a reduction going from reads from assembly to the bins. So when you bin a metagenome, you lose some of the genetic information. So you, you may not see all the genetic information that's in the met metagenome model. So that's also one uh, important reason to look at a uh, metagenome model and try to understand the overall metabolism because of the reduction, some of the pathways may disappear from these from these um, bin models. <clears throat> so in KBase, we have uh, the built uh, metagenome model tools that you can um, build a metagenome model that represent the overall metabolism. And we also have a compartmentalized community model uh, tools to build a compartmentalized community model. Uh, the tool is merge metabolic models into community model. That's, this is where we take these bin models, uh, high abandoned bin models, the major players in a system, and then we can build a compartmentalized community model. And we can factor the relative abundance into this and uh, with a compartmentalized model. So each, uh, each organism is a compartment and where we can identify the trophic interactions, who's producing what, so who's the main carbon fixer, or uh, who's uh, have the degradation pathways for a given nutrient and what is it excreting and uh, another, another organism use that excreted compounds as a carbon source. So th those, uh, those relationships can be, can be uh, determined from this kind of a tool. Uh, however, we are not uh, using this tool in this today's workforce, but we do use the uh, metagenome uh, metabolic model construction tool today in today's workforce. So, um, so we uh, have we we have the metagenome assemblies and also the bin assemblies, and then we uh, identify the functional annotations based on these assemblies using the RAST annotation pipeline. And then we build uh, these uh, metabolic models. And so it's important to talk about how we derive biochemical reactions in these models. So the, what we get from the annotation is that we have the annotation algorithms identify a feature like a gene. And then it's also assigns functional roles like pyruvate kinase. And then we have this complex, uh, we, we have this concept of complex that um, that for in this case, the pyruvate kinase is a uni enzyme that we map to a complex and then we identify a biochemical reaction. So this biochemical reaction get added to the model. So in case of a uh, enzyme that has multiple subunits like NADP transhydrogenase, so that comes from two genes, alpha and beta subunit, we map both these um, subunits to a complex and we want to satisfy this complex, uh, assume with that both of these uh, subunits are present. And if the both of the subunits are present, then only we add this biochemical reaction into the model. And this is also uh, helpful when we try to compute gene essentiality. So the gene essentiality computation is like one of the, uh, when, you, uh, when we uh, simulate, uh, when we do knockout simulations, if you knock out this particular feature here, that means that this complex will be no longer satisfied. And then we have to, um, we have to 
remove this reaction from the predictions or, or avoid this reaction during the prediction. So it, it, the complex is really helpful to identify whether to see that all the subunits are present in order to add the uh, biochemical reaction and also when you do knockout simulations to remove a particular uh, reaction from the models. And in the recent developments, um, recent developments that we have add other ontologies into our model construction tools. Um, uh, previously that we have to have the RAST annotations because we uh, maintain a controlled vocabulary that we map these uh, functional roles to the biochemical e equations that, but many people were requesting from the user community that they want to build based on other ontologies. So we have added that uh, capability to our model construction tools that you can build uh, models uh, based on KOs or EC numbers or metasic reactions in a prioritized order. So you one could prioritize, okay, I want the RAST, look at the RAST annotations first and then KEG KOs or EC numbers. So um, one of the uh, most essential uh, components in our model construction pipeline is we want to get the ATP yield predictions right. So if you, if you want to study the behavior of an organism, that's, that's, what the medic, uh, one of, that's what the metabolic models are being used. And uh, if you want to study the behavior, the ATP yield predictions, the energy prediction is very, very essential. And so we um, made, uh, we put a special attention and effort to get the ATP yield predictions right. So we paid attention to the central metabolic pathways, all the fermentation pathways that we could find from the literature and, and the electron transport chains that we can uh, find from the literature. So as, as many of you know, Bacteria is a mess, so they have they have a lot of anaerobic electron uh, acceptors, and um, so we need to factor these into our metabolic model so we can predict uh, we can represent the energy metabolism correctly and also predict the ATP yields correctly. So right now we have uh, the all these electron acceptors. Um, able to capture the uh, reductions of all these electron acceptors and we are expanding that list uh, to like sulfate, thiosulfate, uh, met metal oxidation and so forth. So once once we uh, once we able to get the accurate ATP yield predictions now then in our predictions you could see if the organism is grows under aerobic conditions like E. coli you can see the theoretical ATP yield is close to 26.5 where uh, none of the electron acceptors are present, then the same organism then able to grow by fermentation and at, at which point the ATP yield is close to two. And then if you have anaerobic electron acceptors like nitrate or trimethylamine oxide, so then still you have the anaerobic respiratory, respiratory chain is functional at that point and you can generate slightly higher ATP, yield, ATP yields. So this, uh, this this uh, functions are right now available in KBase in uh, beta mode app and very soon will be released, released this app uh, so you can uh, use as the released app. So we also uh, worked on other improvements uh, in our model construction pipeline. So uh, we address the ATP yield unrealistic energy biosynthesis pathways and we want to import, uh, we want to improve the, the transporters of our model and the transporter curation is a, is a very complex uh, process because the, the genome annotations are not clear and incomplete on many of the transporters. And, um, and also we want to capture the biochemistry from the public databases, which is also a very complex process. And because uh, there's no controlled vocabulary that is uh, everybody works, uh, everybody developing these databases. So um, this is a demo, this is a, um, a, a, a TCA cycle map that shows that uh, previously in our models that we weren't able to capture all the, uh, the pathways and its fluxes. And this is just one example, but uh, across, across the models now we were able to capture pathways and we could accurately predict the flux distributions with these improved, um, improved efforts into our model construction pipeline. So I'm not going to talk about the flux balance analysis. You guys heard in depth uh, about flux balance analysis. However, in the, in the context of KBase apps, uh, 
So, um, uh, so if, if you have this kind of a toy model that these are the compounds and the, the letters are the reactions that uh, assuming steady state, so the, the type of the models that we are talking about today is a steady state models. So in a steady state model, the no uh, internal metabolites are allowed to accumulate no degrade. So everything that converts to uh, compound two needs to be uh, converted to compound three. So in that case, the, the at steady states, the rates are equal that you can see all the rates are equal here. And uh, and in, in this in this particular example, because the most of the example that you don't see these linear pathways as my earlier uh, earlier demonstration, but most of the time you see these branched pathways like you know uh, glucose coming into the cell that it can get oxidized in three different ways, and glycolysis, uh, intraduodenal pathway, and uh, 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 and uh, um, another pathway that uh, oxidize sugar. So in that, in that way, it can distribute into uh, three different pathways. So if the, if the um, uh, certain nutrients enter the cell at the rate of 60, that you could see that uh, this can distribute into multiple pathways, but, the, uh, but the, the accumulation of these rates are equal. So the reason um, that I am uh, explaining this is I want to come to uh, uh, I won't come to these slides and explain about knowledge gaps and how um, how the, the this flux balance analysis fails if we don't have if we have the knowledge gaps. So th there are, we could find knowledge gaps even with the well uh, studied organisms like E. coli or B. subtilis, and um, so because we don't understand the whole metabolism, we even for E. coli, uh, thirty to forty percent of genes we don't know what they do uh, and um, and it's worst in other organisms so if you do have a, uh, a gap then the uh, flux balance analysis or the predictions uh, fails and it doesn't work as this compound cannot um, accumulate nor degrade so we need to find these metabolic gaps in order to have a functional model so that's what uh, i'm showing here so, uh, so I'm comparing uh, here that a uh, how we gap fill our approach of gap filling in a model in a rich medium versus minimal medium. So this slide explains how we gap fill uh, organism in the rich medium. So in a rich medium, so there are these are the metabolic gaps that uh, that in the model, and in a rich medium, all these nutrients are uh, present and. Uh, in, in, if that is the case, when the when the uh, gap filling algorithm does it, it will add a transporter and import and import these nutrients into the cell and satisfy the biomass. So you would see lesser number of reactions get added to the model if you run gap filling on a rich uh, on a rich medium, because it doesn't need to biosynthesize all these compounds in the biomass like amino acids, the vitamins, the fatty acids because it can simply uptake these nutrients from the medium and satisfy the biomass. This is, this is also exactly what's happening in the laboratory. And you, you could see that if you grow a cell in a rich medium like LB, it doesn't need to biosynthesize all the end uh, components uh, that, that, that it needs to satisfy the biomass, that it could simply uptake those nutrients from LB and then uh, the cell, cell can grow. However, if you try to grow a cell in glucose minimal medium, then what happens? So the, every single biomass component, all vitamins, that has to be synthesized from that sole carbon source of glucose. In that case, it has to activate all its pathways and synthesize every single component that is needed to survive if it has the pathways. So it, the, similarly, the, the, in, if you gap fill in minimal medium, uh, so then it will gap fill all these biosynthetic pathways towards the end products uh, like the amino acids and vitamins and quinones and so forth. So if you gap fill in minimal medium, you could see more gap filling reactions that you will be able to see that today in your, in your tutorials and uh, compared to uh, rich medium.
So where we find these gap filling reactions, so we, uh, we fetch all the uh, biochemistry that we can access from the public databases and then we reconcile, we, uh, reconcile all these reactions into uh, controlled vocabulary and we uh, then uh, use these uh, biochemical reactions to fill these gaps. So finally, um, so once we have the uh, metagenome model, uh, metagenome models and also the bin models, then um, in today's workflows that we will compare your metagenome model across all the bins. So this is a, uh, there's an app, uh, the model comparison app that you could find in your tutorials. It's very, uh, it's a very rich, uh, useful analysis app that you could see the, uh, uh, you could see this analysis like in this case I'm showing that so this is the metagenome model and these are the all the bins and uh, so I'm comparing now the the gap filling reactions and you could see for an instance that for the metagenome model has less number of gap filled reactions compared to the bins the reason being that metagenome model is is an accumulation of all these all these uh, bins so that's why um, the metagenome model has less number of gap filled reactions compared to the bin and some of the bins has lots of gap filling reaction that's also an indication that um, this may be a not good quality bin that it needs to gap fill lots ton of pathways in order to uh, provide a, a flux distribution so uh, this this app also gives some statistics and here and so here it shows the um, number of gap filling that it needed in the rich media and the also the ATP yields that this is related to the, uh, the central metabolism um, uh, and ATP yields that I explained previously. And here you could see right away for some of the bins, the ATP yields are close to 26.5. So this indicates that these bins are aerobes that they, they are capable of growing in the presence of oxygen and 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 has an atp yield close to um to a, close to 26.5 which is the theoretical yield of atp atp yield of e coli and um then you can see some organisms has the atp yield close to uh, two and this means that uh, these organisms most likely to be uh, aerob, anaerobes, strict anaerobes that, that they can only fermentate and produce about two ATPs. With, and uh, also uh, there's another indication as I, as I mentioned previously that if there's ton of gap filling, especially in rich media, that's also an indication that these are poor quality bins. Um, so this, this can be also, uh, the, these numbers also uh, could be considered if you want to remove these poor quality bins for your downstream analysis. So with that, I would like to thank everyone who is involved, uh, the KBase group and everybody um, at EMSOL and everybody at Argon that who helped to get this going. And uh, now uh, if I have time, I would like to demo uh, the narrative workflow uh, so to get a better an idea. Becky, how much time I have? It's now 1043. You have about, uh, here, until 1115. So you have quite a bit of time. Okay. So, um, so this is the, uh, the workflow today. So um, many of the students are very familiar with the, uh, the K-based environment now that um, all the narratives for today's narratives are added to the, the Microbial Dynamic Summer School organization that all the narrative for today's narratives are labeled with the day three, summer school day three. And you, you see here that it will give a description of what this, uh, what this workflow is about. And it will give you a, a menu that you can navigate to each of the steps. So you can click any of the steps that will go. And so what we are doing here is that uh, we are importing a metagenome assembly into the narrative. And then we annotate that metagenome assembly with RAS TK, RAS uh, annotation pipeline, and this will give um, this will the rust will identify the genes and assign functions. Uh, 
and you'll be able to uh, search your favorite functions like pyruvate synthase uh, and that will this is a searchable table that should show up um, the annotations that you want to see and it's really nice that uh, the RAS also categorize these annotations into subsystems so this is similar to the modules in a DRAM that you have seen on Monday so um, they categorize all the annotations into the subsystem and subsystem classes which which very helpful to um, see the annotations in the context of these areas of um, metabolism. And then um, we built a metabolic model based on those RAS annotation. And uh, so this is where I was explaining about the gap filling. So uh, while we build the metagenome, we also gap fill these uh, models. And so the gap filling and uh, gap filling uh, reactions as a list is given here and and it, it will show this reaction either added or sometimes existing re reaction has to be reversed in order to get a flux distribution so um, in this example i see only the added is being mentioned here but sometimes you can see the keyword reversed for some of the for some of the reactions and this, this tutorials will give uh, explanation of explanatory text for all the fields that uh, you want to look for. So typically you will, uh, you will see all the reactions in the reaction tab that this is also a searchable table. You can search the reactions, compounds, and the compartments typically that here we have the cytosol and extracellular compartments, list of biomass compounds, and the, the gap filling, uh, gap filling iterations that we used uh, in this model and also the pathways uh, so these are cake pathways that paints what genes are present and absence on the uh, on, on different cake maps so then we want to um, gap fill these models in minimal media so in this case we import minimal media formulations into the narrative and then we get filling the minimal media compared to a complete media. So again, there's a list get added. So this is what I was mentioning earlier. Some of the reaction you can see, you could see that it was reversed instead of adding. So that was existing reaction in the model rather than adding that the, it was reversed in order to get a uh, flux profile. So then we uh, analyze the individual beans. So in this case, we'll bulk uh, annotate all these all the beans that related to a particular sample and um, that's also we uh, we annotate with rust annotation pipeline and then we bulk build individual bin models in the system and so in a, in a typical FDA, FDA model, so again, the output table is very similar to what I shown earlier. You could see reactions, compounds, uh, the individual genes that map to those reactions and the biomass and also the gap filling events. So then we run the flux balance analysis in the system, which creates a flux distribution. And here that you will be able to see the objective value, the growth, uh, how much the growth uh, is measured and in this case, you can uh, see the fluxes of, uh, of four uh, individual equations. And also you see the exchange fluxes. This is where the what compounds were excreted or what, what compounds were uh, uptake into the uh, model. And um, exchange fluxes, are, up, fluxes are, uh, could be accessed from here. So finally, we, um, we compare the model as I mentioned earlier. So um, we run the model comparison and the model comparison is that we compare, uh, we compare the uh, metagenome model against its bins. And um, so this is a very rich app that it has many uh, ways of that you can analyze uh, your metagenome models and, against uh, against all the bins and so check this out and your ts will help to um, we have to identify we will help to explain this app and how you can use uh, to uh, address your scientific questions and then uh, then in the next talk the uh, chris will explain um, how we uh, load the fdicr data into the system and then expand uh, the existing compounds 
into novel compounds and map these novel compounds to the uh, FTICR data, which is I'm um, looking forward to be a very exciting talk. And, and that's, that's all I have. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks, Janika. Um, so this is this is really exciting. I wanted to mention to all of the participants that the narratives that Janika is showing here um, are going to be used by our students in our afternoon uh, hands-on session, but they are available publicly on KBase as well. Um, again, you can find them by searching for uh, Summer School Day Three. But we would encourage uh, the public, if possible, to not not uh, copy the narratives and run them uh, maybe until after the course ends, just to avoid overloading the K-based servers. But um, definitely, those are available for you to look at and um, and play with uh, on your own as well. So um, I have a, f a number of questions that come in. So you're you're a little bit. Uh, you're a little bit early. Um, one of the questions, and I think you already addressed this, but um, why, why do you consider minimal media and not complete media at your first step of model construction? And I guess that's probably the first step of gap filling. So the, the, so the gap filling is a uh, computationally extensive process. So uh, if you want to gap fill, do iterative gap filling and find out what will be the minimal set of reactions to gap fill in a rich media, so that's why um, you could uh, use the complete media first. So that the complete media is the, the, the rich medium that you can get. So in that case, what happens is that um, it will assess all the transporters in the model and it will provide uh, every nutrients that the model has the transporter for. So then if you want to get fill in minimal media, you can do another iteration of um, gap fill in minimal media and in that case, if you do iterative gap filling, it will add less number of gap filling and um, as an iterative gap filling. So then you can identify what the, the, the difference between complete media and the minimal media, what additional reactions that was added when it grows on glucose minimal media. Hmm. Okay. So it will give a further, further, uh, further clarity between the rich media and the minimal media. Okay. Um, so another question that was, you know, that people were talking about over in Discord is, you know, if you could maybe explain a little bit about model curation. So as you're developing these genome models, where it's for a metagenome or for a bin or for an individual organism, and you're using these an automated annotation pipelines, how much do you need to do any sort of manual curation of that? Or what does that mean when you do curation of your model? Okay, so that's, that's a very good question. So um, when we, um, so let me go to that. So when we, uh, when we annotate a genome and then uh, derive a metabolic model, what you get is a draft metabolic model. And, and that has lots of gaps. So the system give you a draft metabolic model, which is a good starting point for somebody to uh, curate, the meta curate the metabolic model. So when we gap fill, the gap filling is, is based on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's based on um, the media. So, so it's based on the media. So this is an algorithm, the optimization algorithm that's try to find the minimal set of reactions. So that's the gap filling strategy right now in KBase, we find a minimal set of reactions to fill these gaps. And these solutions, uh, this, it could be wrong. So, because there's a lots of lump reactions in the databases and, uh, and uh, also the strategies to um, identify the minimal set of reactions. So it, 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 it could be, it's possible that there's a eight step pathway that it can add like four lumped reaction to fill that, uh, fill that gap. So the curation is very, very important that so if you are the expert of a particular organism and you know the biochemical pathways well, I, the recommendation is that uh, you would curate the model. So for an instance, so here we have an app called edit model. So here using this kind of app, you can delete, add reactions that if you know the biochemical pathways very well. And it's, it's very essential to get your, uh, get your metabolism uh, and if you know very well your, uh, the metabolism of your organism and to get that right. 
Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So you can, so you can use the automated processes, but then you have some flexibility to add, say, expert information using the edit metabolic model as well. Yeah, all all highly curated models, the, all the published models, they are all um, hand curated, and and we have this uh, we have this tremendous effort right now. We are going through in our modeling pipeline and on the fungal uh, model construction pipeline. Actually, that we are working with PNNL uh, scientists at PNNL to improve these uh, curation. So that's how all comes down to um, hand curation, time-consuming hand curation. Right. That's that. There's no way of avoiding that to get these high quality models. And what role does um, you know direct experiments and measurements like Mark was talking about in Fluxomics? How how does that play into curation? So I I refer to uh, Chris if you are here to answer that question. So uh, in generally we could reconcile uh, the uh, you know, the growth phenotypic data or the expression data that we can reconcile. So in, based on the expression data that we can turn on and off reactions based on the expression data. So if, the, if there's no, absolutely no expression for a certain gene that the particular uh, reaction we forced not to be active. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, similarly for uh, metabolomics, uh, the fluxomic data also could be used the similar way that if there's no data for in that particular environmental or media condition, that uh, we do not activate those reactions. And so that's how the, the, uh, the phenotypic data can be reconciled into, uh, into models. Chris, if you want to add uh, how the fluxomic data can improve the predictions, uh, please uh, go ahead. Um, I would say uh, the, the thing to remember about FBA is that there's not one answer. <laughs> the solution you get from FBA is a valid solution to optimize the given objective function, which is typically biomass. There are many different solutions that will give you optimal biomass production. So there's not one answer there. Fluxomics can help narrow that down. But here's the other thing. FBA optimizes biomass. Your organisms do not. Um, many of them come close. And that's why we use that as a proxy for you know, knowledge of what your genome actually does. Fluxomics actually, you know, figures out based on the, your measurements, what your organism is actually doing. So fluxomics can actually figure out what the real flux is. FBA only approximates it based on some kind of uh, objective function. And the thing, the thing to remember is that um, you might want to pick a different objective function um, to get a better answer for your genome you know, if you're in an environment where it's not optimizing biomass. So that's some, some uh, that's a critical piece of thinking when you're using this tool. Okay, that's really interesting. So so given that, Chris and Janika, can you give us a little bit of um, insight or maybe uh, your own experience as to how, how well these kinds of models are actually able to predict observed behavior? So if you simulate a batch system and you control the environment, um, and you predict the amount of uptake of a certain, you know, substrate. How, how well, in general, are, have in your experience, have these metabolic models performed? Yeah, and uh, for E. coli, uh, I mean, this is what um, the the seminal paper that announced that uh, you know really described the use of bi optimization of biomass. Um, as an objective function for FBA was by Paulson. And what he shows in that paper is uh, Bernard Paulson at UCSD. Uh, what he shows in that paper is uh, um, that optimal biomass works for E. coli when it's growing on its own in a reactor with a lot of nutrient. Um, so um, it, does, it does definitely predict yields quite well for a lot of different organisms in a lot of different environments. Um, people have used it to predict, you know, biolog growth rates with some approximate you know, accuracy. Uh, it's been used uh, to predict. Uh, what Uwe Zauer will show you is that um, often organisms don't grow in, uh, at the optimal rate, but they grow very close to it. So he calls it like, if you imagine the solution space is a piece of cake, organisms often grow where the, the, optim the objective function is towards the top of the, the cake. Or organisms grow in the frosting. <laughs> um, and that I think it's a really nice visualization. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's a good approximation in many conditions, but 
and ecological conditions in soil um, is where unfortunately it starts to break down because organisms, it's a very complicated, like it's all about fitness really. And nests growing fast doesn't necessarily maximize your fitness in soil. Right. right. Yeah, that's definitely one of the complications we have to address as we start going towards ecosystem problems. Yeah. Um, here, here's another question that was in the Zoom chat, uh, Janica. So you talked about losing information when we go from a metagenome-based model to a bin-based model. So for the full, full metagenome, we tend to be able to use more of the genes, whereas when we, or more of the reads, and when we assemble bins, we lose some of those reads. Um, and the question was about asking if, if what we're really losing there is related to only rare organisms that occur less in abundance, or is there something else? And is there any way to avoid this in terms of bioinformatics? So um, the one of the reasons that we lose in this, um, the genomic, uh, genomic information is that during the bean process that uh, they use some criteria like tetrahydronucleotide frequency or uh, and other criteria to bin uh, these to make make these individual bins, and if a certain whatever the criteria that this algorithm uses doesn't capture that genomic information, and that that won't get into uh, any of the bins, uh, and um, and it it could be uh, it's it's a very low abundance organisms. And um, and so, but I have seen that in some of the some of the communities that even the low abundance organisms that they capture, uh, some of they are low abundance, but the metabolism is is uh, fairly complete. And uh, sometimes you see this that pathways that occur in the metagenome, and the reactions that occur in the metagenome model, but does not find that reaction in any of the bins. Mm. Okay. Great. Um, and a follow-up to the question uh, just came through, including KMERS or unique KMERS to rare taxa can help avoid this problem? Uh, I refer to Chris. Chris probably have a better idea of um, how the KMERS uh, would able to avoid this. What's the problem again? The uh... Uh, the problem of losing losing information when you go to bin your metagenome, and 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 the question is like uh, uh, related to the KMERS, right? So uh, would right. KMERS would KMERS contribute to avoid this problem? Um, there's a lot of things that contribute to this problem. Um, the the uh, uh, failure of of assembly. Um, uh, and so you have a certain fraction of reads that get lost because they just don't get integrated in assemblies. Um, that fraction is quite large in soil. Um, it's maybe more like 40 or even 30% in gut. Um, but there's that loss. You could potentially, and I've seen people propose this, but it, it's still sci-fi to me. Yeah, I mean, you can, of course, annotate raw reads with taxonomy and function, and then perhaps use that to recruit to bins. I, I think it, it might be possible in the future, but the problem is, is the best you'll be able to do is recruit to bins at a pretty low OTU specificity. Uh, and, that, and that's a problem. So you might be able to make like OTU level, like genre level bins that way and sort of recover some of your lost reads. And the, and the same sort of strategy could be applied to lost contigs, unbent contigs. Um, but it's always gonna be approximate. The best you'll do is to, you know, recover those things into genre or even family or order level, um, you know, bins and, and, that, and species level binning at the moment is really not possible. Um, uh, it, maybe for some genomes that are extremely well surveyed in the reference space. Um, but I, so I, I think it's, there are some things you can do. There's no tooling that I'm aware of that supports any of that. You'd have to manually do it by mixing and matching a bunch of, you know, tools that are out there, you know, Kraken and MGRAS for functional annotation or Kraken or, or Human2 for functional annotation or Kraken for taxonomical annotation. Mm 
Yeah, I think if you look at the numbers Janica is showing right now from the wonders data from the different rivers, even just the uh, uh, straight metagenome assembly, at the most, it's getting 56% of the reads. So, uh. <laughs> exactly. It's it's. Um, I think the thing to remember is what is in that. I've looked at a lot of systems um, with this approach of assembly and then annotation and modeling. And what I found is that the species breakdown you get from the assemblies it's not too far off of like here, here there's, here's, a, here's a test you can you can run NK based to kind of explore this. You could annotate with Kaiju or Kraken and look at your species distribution. And the nice thing about Kaiju or Kraken is they won't lose those reads. Um, and then you could look at the coverage and species distribution you get from your bins and use GTDB uh, to uh, assign your bins um, to a taxonomical range. And compare those two and see like, are, is your Kraken or Kaiju distribution wildly different from your bin distribution? And in my experience, admittedly is mostly in gut, and the answer is no. Um, and so you aren't, what you're getting out of the assembly is the highest abundance genomes, which is arguably a lot of the highest, you know, abundance is gonna to translate to flux. There's gonna be a lot of the highest fluxes in your environment. Um, but, uh, and so you could argue that's the most important thing. Of course, you know, there are low flux processes that are very, very important and you're, and you're gonna have a hard time addressing those with assembly-based approaches. Right, okay, great. Um, here's a, here's another question. So, it, and I'm not sure I'm I. Well, I'll just read it. Is KBase able to reconstruct metabolic network by orthology? Um, that question refers to using different ontologies. I'm not really oh, sure. No, no. I, or or I, propagation. By orthology. I think what they're referring to is our maybe. <laughs> our model propagation method. Propagation, yeah, that's what I think. You can import a model, any model you want in the K-Base. Um, the import tools are, are rough, <laughs> um, but you can import a model, whatever model you want, built with whatever annotation you want, whatever chemistry you want. And there is a tool in K-Base, if you just look up the word propagate, that lets you propagate that model to any other genome based off of um, orthology. And so you run the proteome comparison tool first to compute um, corresponding proteomes based on bidirectional best match. And then you run the propagation tool with that proteome comparison and it will build a, it'll translate the model you've imported to a new model. And that's actually how our current fungal model reconstruction tool works essentially um, is by uh, that orthology kind of um, based translation. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, so this, this tool can be used that anybody wants to build a, uh, a model based on a published model that is out there, well-curated published model. And if your organism of interest is phylogenetically very close to that published model, uh, the organisms that the published model was built, you can import that published model into the uh, K-base and then generate a proteome comparison against the genome of that public, uh, published model and uh, of your genome of interest, and then you can propagate that biochemistry, building a new model for your uh, genome of interest. It, okay. Now, I mentioned that our, our system doesn't do a good job with cyano and archaea. And so yeah. with cyano and archaea, I would definitely recommend using this app uh, with a published ar with archaea model, which, of which there are many, um, and, uh, uh, or a published cyano model. Yeah, so a follow-up question just came through on that. How close do the genomes need to be to use this propagation tool? The closer, the better. <laughs> <laughs> my, my suggestion is try it out and see how it works. Look at your proteome comparison and, and, and think critically about that. So the proteome comparison tool tells you what fraction of the genes in, in your genome had a corresponding gene in the other genome you're comparing to. And if that fraction is pretty low, just be aware, like if only 50% of your genes match, well, at best, your propagation is only gonna capture 50% of your genome. Um, 
of the metabolic capabilities of your genome. Now, our propagation tool does let you use RAST and Model C to try to fill in, try to capture ad content from the other 50%, but still, that's just something to bear in mind. That's a good measure of how close you, you need to be. Okay. So that's, that's what this merging K-based model, um, the functionality does. It, it will also do a, a traditional way of uh, deriving the reactions based on the RAST annotations in addition to propagation. Okay, well, I think uh, we have a lot of other questions over in uh, Discord, and I know Chris has been over there actively answering a number of those already. Um, but, Jonica, if you want to also take a look over there while Chris is talking, uh, yes, that would be great. I think, uh, are, are you ready to go, Chris? Do you want to? I know we're a few minutes early for your talk, but we could get started if you're ready to go. Sure. Okay, so. Uh, so the next presentation is um, on integrating metabolomic data into metabolic models. And so this is uh, an exciting follow-up to yesterday's uh, discussion, which was all about metabolomics data. And so uh, we're excited to hear this from Chris. And so Chris, go ahead and take it away. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you guys see that? Uh, yeah, I see your Discord screen and yeah. there's your slides. And uh, I can't, my button is hiding from me. There we go. All right, can you see the slides? Yep, now I see your slide in, present, in presentation mode. All right. Great. Uh, so, uh, so this will be a tutorial on the integration. Oh, why is that? Okay, I'll just click. There we go. Uh, it's a tutorial on the integration of metabolomics and the modeling and uh, um, the day two workflow that you saw yesterday really covers this um, FTICR metabolomics to M over Z values for peaks, um, and then predicted formula using the formulator tool, and then a whole bunch of analysis you can do with the output of that. So that's not really tying in the, the genomics data yet. Um, so it's focused on the metabolomics side, although you, some of the statistical analysis does let you correlate um, to that data. So predictive property analysis is predicting things like thermodynamics and, and um, other properties based on formula aromaticity, things like that. Um, chemical transformation predict prediction, which can be done both from mass differences between peaks or formula. Um, transformation network analysis, so just making a network out of these predictive formulations, statistical, statistical analysis, correlating um, peaks with various things, and then the lambda analysis that Ken covered. And then day one, you have been through metagenomics. You, uh, Kelly and the other presenters um, cover how you convert metagenomes and the contigs to either a annotated metagenome assembly, with, which um, Jonica, I think, just talked about, and then bins or binning, and then um, a annotation uh, of bins into what we call metagenome assembled genomes or MACs. Um, and then what Jonica just covered is the metagenome models we can build from the annotated metagenome assembly, which is sort of a giant mixed bag of your microbiome, or uh, these genome models that can be built from bins and then the gap filling and flux balance analysis. But how to tie these two worlds together? And the answer is, or one of the answers is cheminformatics. Um, so we want to link models to metabolomics data. And the step one for doing that is to map the metabolomics peaks to the model. Um, so we can use a formula match. Uh, we generally don't do this with mass. Uh, at the very least, we want to have a formula from formulator. Now, remember yesterday, formulator is not going to give you a formula for every mass. Um, but uh, it'll give you a formula for a lot of them, typically about 5,000 for these FTICR data sets that I've seen. Um, and this is weak, uh, and the reason is because many compounds have many different compounds, potentially very different compounds, have identical formula. Um, or a structure match, uh, which is much better, uh, but still not perfect because of stereoisomers. So what I mean by structure match is something like a smile string. If they give you an inchy key, and they will, um, if you do MSMS uh, with Trent Northern or Oliver Fien or one of these metabolomics labs, or, or uh, at Enzo with Tom, uh, if they give you an, an inchy key, just be aware, just go ahead and strip the stereoisomer information off of that inchy key and do a match on the base of that key um, because 
metabolomics can't give you stereoisomerization um, at the moment. I mean, there are some some exceptions, and it, talk to Josh, and he can, Josh Adkins, he can tell you about what they can do with the cutting edge stuff today. But generally, expect that you'll get a non-stereoisomer um, base structure. A structure map, though, is much better. There's far fewer stereoisomer um, redundancy in the chemical networks than there is, for example, formula redundancy. And then, uh, you know, currently mass spec is, yeah, that's already made that point. Um, so there's three, four scenarios that then arise when you try to do this mapping. The first scenario one is you know what the metabolite is, you know what the structure is. Again, FTICR, you're generally not going to get a structure. It's not MSMS. Um, they're going to, they're working on that but currently it doesn't do that. But if they do have the structure from it, if you run MSMS, um, then you'll, you know what the structure is, you find it in the model. That's scenario one, great, it's in your model. You can run FBA, you can explore how the model uses that metabolite, you can model the metabolomics data. Um, scenario two, the metabolites in the database, you find it in the database, it's a structure match, we know what it is. Um, but it's not in our model. Well, Jonica just showed you the gap filling tools. We can make the model make that metabolite. And so we can integrate the metabolite into the model that way. And now we have this additional evidence-based way of filling holes in the model, which is very cool. That's what we want to do. And once we've got it in the model using the gap filling, then we can go to this, you know, running FBA to study the metabolite. Scenario three, we have the structure. We know what the metabolite is structurally but we do not know what pathways to, um, it's not in the databases. The compound is not in the databases. So we have no pathway to the structure. And this is where the cheminformatics comes in. Um, but also scenario four, which unfortunately with FTICR, this is where you're at um, it, at the moment. Um, you have a formula, you don't actually have a structure. So it's sort of this hypothetical thing. Um, but again, the cheminformatics offers a mechanism to get at those formula um, with a mechanistic uh, basis. So what you saw on day two was sort of non-mechanistic formula derived analysis. And there's a lot of very powerful things you can do with that. What we're gonna talk about here is, okay, can we mechanistically do anything to mechanistically understand why those formula are there? And again, this is where your um, FTICR data is, really is formula scenario four. So, Overarching challenge with linking metabolomics to models is that there's this dark matter problem. People talk, you've heard dark matter in biology before, and it's usually referring to proteins of unknown function, but there's dark matter metabolomics too. There's metabolites of unknown, you know, uh, that, that we don't think should, that we see in biological systems, but are not in biological databases. Uh, there's no universal method for measuring small molecules, so that's a contributing factor to this challenge is that there's just a lot of different, you know, I talked about FTICR versus LCMS, uh, MSMS, um, and FTICR can be LCMS um, if you, you know, put some separations in front of it. Um, so generally, it's only possible to confidently identify five to 20% of the features in an MSMS data set. So if you don't have MSMS, you're not confidently identifying anything. You can get a molecular, a very, you can get a molecular formula with fair level of confidence for a large fraction of the peaks with FTICR. That's one of the advantages of that method is the highly fine resolution on the masses gives you a, a pretty good idea of what the formula is. But you, even if you have MSMS, you only get five to 20%. Why? Because the other 80% aren't in structured databases and you can't MSMS identification relies on knowing a structure, predicting how it will decompose, and then comparing those predictions to your MSMS fragmentation pattern. So the, there's this other issue that the structure isn't in the database. You're gonna have a hard time finding the compound using this technology. Um, or what they really do with MSMS is acquire a sample of the compound and run it side by side. That's called running a standard. Um, and metabolomics. And so again, can't get a standard for this complete, you know, dark matter molecule nobody's seen in a system before. Um, but it leads to this, you know, cycle of the models are incomplete. So we don't, because the models and the knowledge is incomplete, we can't, you know, properly annotate our data, which leads to incomplete knowledge. <laughs> so this is the, you know, Kelly talked about this same problem in annotation. 
the protein function knowledge is incomplete. So our not, you know, if our knowledge is incomplete, then we can't annotate completely. And if because we can't annotate completely, we lead to uh, you know incomplete knowledge. Um, so we have this same cycle of metabolomic data. Well, we have a way. Cheminformatics offers one mechanism um, to get around this. Uh, but remember, you're you're at this point. As soon as you start doing cheminformatics, just to be clear. We're diving down the rabbit hole. We're going to Wonderland. Uh, this is, uh, you know, computational prediction of potential novel reactions. So it's not rea it's not real until you prove that it's real. Um, is what I would uh, say. Um, so we can we have these generalized reaction rules that are learned from biochemistry databases, and we can apply these rules systematically to a set of compounds that we're interested in and predict reactions and compounds that could arise, um, new reactions and new compounds, which sort of addresses this missing knowledge problem. And then those new structures that are predicted could give us predicted MSMS and allow us to address this other 80%. Um, and then we search for evidence of these pathways and compounds in our metabolomics and genomics data. So we have three possible um, hypotheses of what could lead to these novel reactions. Uh, we have generalist enzymes. We've got an enzyme that um, it does a mechanism, it does a chemical activity that has been observed before, like, you know, a re, you know oxidation and reduction with NAD and NADH. Um, or, but nobody's seen an enzyme operate on a, this specific substrate. So it's doing a known activity on a new substrate. So we call that promiscuity, although in many cases this is not promiscuity, it's this is an enzyme, this is its primary activity. Um, it's just it, the primary activity of that enzyme is something we've never seen before. And so that, that enzyme is either unannotated or um, incorrectly annotated. So be aware of that. When you have an annotation of an enzyme, it might do that activity, but it might also do something similar to that activity. You have an unannotated enzyme. So there could just be you know, chemical mechanisms that we have not discovered yet. And there's gonna be a lot of those. Um, or spontaneous reactions. So don't forget, this is chemistry. Chemistry happens whether biology is there to make it happen faster or not. Um, so always be aware of this kind of hidden, unpredictable monster in your system. You know, chemistry is gonna happen no matter what, um, particularly if you have a higher temperature uh, system or extreme pH, anything that or oxygen, I mean, anything that, that, you know, in the environment that contributes to faster, just natural chemistry. Um, so how do we use cheminformatics to get at these? So I'm going to talk about this one, the generalist enzymes and the spontaneous reactions. This is like really far out there, computational chemistry. There's people thinking about this, but um, it's still less advanced. Um, so we build enzymatic rules to predict um, uh, new um, reactions based on known mechanisms. And here's an example of how we do this. So if we look at these four different EC numbers with four different reactions, but we actually look at the chemistry that's happening, we see that they all follow the same pattern. There's this you know, functional group, a water is being added, it's being hydrated. You have to have these keto groups there. If you do not, this chemistry doesn't happen. Um, and then this bond can be broken and form a carboxylic acid and a um, terminal um, alkane, a methyl group. Um, so we've learned these. This is based on, originally on work with Hatsumanakata et al. Um, actually stuff I did in my PhD. Uh, and then we, so we have a set of 210 rules um, learned from this. And um, Vasily has gone on, but Vasily Hatsmanakatis has gone on and others have gone on to learn many, many more rules. So this is, um, there are many labs working on this, building better and better rules learned from these databases. And I think machine learning is gonna blow this wide open. Um, for spontaneous chemistry, We've also developed rules, and this is work my lab uh, does in collaboration with uh, um, Andrew Hansen and Oliver Fien. Um, but we have 150 spontaneous rules learned from spontaneous reactions um, in uh, various databases. So we look at those spontaneous reactions and we develop generalized rules that represent with that, the, the chemistry that happens with those spontaneous reactions. So we have rule sets for both spontaneous and enzymatic rules. Um, so 
uh, to discover new pathways, we can apply these rules to a set of starting compounds. So we take all of our rules and apply them to a set of starting compounds. And we get new compounds and new reactions. So this is the novel reaction prediction and novel compound prediction. We can apply them once, but we could just go ahead and apply them again and again and again uh, and get whole long pathways. Um, and the observant among you will quickly say, but Chris, you're going to have about a billion compounds after four or five generations, and you're absolutely right. And so we have to have ways of dealing with that. <laughs> and I'll talk about that here. Um, so, uh, of course, for mine, what we call mines, uh, it, you know, which are called, which are metabolic and silical network expansions, um, we, we can also just look at applying our rules to all biochemical, all known biochemical compounds for one generation and make this giant hypothetical database to try and deal with this dark matter problem. And we've done this with KEG, Echo Psych, and YMDB, and this is what you get. So you have about 20, 15 to 20,000 compounds in KEG. Initially, we apply our rules. We have almost a million compounds and reactions in the mine, which is just an expansion of KEG with our enzymatic rules. And we've done this with our spontaneous rules recently as well. And we've done this with EchoPsych and YMDB, which is a yeast database, and EchoPsych is E. coli. Um, and we get about um, a 50x expansion in number of compounds. And there's a site you can go to called mindatabase.mcs.anl.gov to explore that stuff. So um, take a look if you want to see what, at this site, if you want to explore the chemistry that gets produced. But that's one iteration of our rules. So if your pathway is two or three steps out from the known knowledge, the mine isn't going to help you. And one of the nice properties of this database, if you compare the contents of the mine um, to something like PubChem, which of course also has you know, more than a million compounds, it has um, tens of millions, I think, at this point. Um, but Pub PubChem is a general database, not a bio database. And you can see that here. If you look at natural product likeness of the PubChem database, the mine expansion of keg looks a lot more like keg than it does pubkim. So that's a nice, you know, it's more biological. What does the mine and chem informatics let you do with metabolomics data? Well, for example, I've got this compound that was observed with metabolomics data, you know, with based on MSMS, we know that it's S succinyl glutathione, but it wasn't in the database. Well, the chem informatics predicted that, well, if you combine glutathione and fumarate in this novel reaction, it'll make this compound. And here's the evidence for that reaction to happen. Well, cysteine will combine with fumarate and form, you know, succinyl cysteine. Um, and so you can say, well, then I, if this can happen, then maybe this can happen as well. And so I've now mechanistically come up with a hypothesis of how this peak came to be. And I can look for enzymes now that might do this, isolate the enzyme, purify it, test it um, in a test tube and see if the chemistry happens. Um, same thing with this uh, second reaction. So this has been successfully applied for a couple of compounds in E. coli. So look, we actually came up with new compounds and the most studied bacteria ever. Um, and we still found new stuff. Um, there's uh, C. Reinhardii and human cancer cells. So there's new in, there's new chemistry happening in human cancer cells because the cells are all out of whack. Um, and then Artemisia douglasiana. So there's a number of um, new discoveries that come from this cheminformatic expansion. Um, but what do we want to do? We want mechanism and we want enzymes, not just hypothetical reactions. So how do we find the genes once we have a reaction that we that can make the metabolite that we see in the FTICR data, how do we find the gene that might be responsible for making that? Well, if you go back to what Kelly was talking about on Monday, uh, the, you, know, you, you have annotation, which has this just fundamental strategy that if I wanna know the gene that does this reaction in organism A, I can go to a database of other organisms and find genes that do the reaction there and just do a, you know, look for homology and then say, oh, well, you know, gene 43 in organism A is homologous to these, highly homologous. And so I think it's the one doing this reaction. That, that's, that is the fundamental basis for most genome annotation that happens today. But what about cheminformatics? Well, reaction two is a novel reaction. 
I go to my database, I am out of luck. There is no reaction two in my database. There are no genes. Um, so what do I do instead? Um, well, it goes back to what I described earlier. If you have the, uh, let me get this bumped out of the way. If you know uh, similar reactions, you can find similar known reactions in the database that maybe have the same chemical mechanism, maybe the same cofactors and a very similar primary substrate. Then you can say, well, the genes that do this probably with some mutation or modification could do this as well. And so I'm going to argue like, well, let's do a reverse lookup on a, you know, blast and, uh, and see if, okay, this gene come up with candidates to do this. And you'll have to go with some uh, lower similarity thresholds if you do this. Um, and you're going to get a lot of candidates. So the one thing we have successfully applied this to find genes that for novel reactions that then we you know, successfully um, tested in the lab. We're not the only ones, others have done this. Um, so this does work, but you get a lot of candidates. You generally want to combine it with other sources of evidence. Like in our case, we did um, transcriptomics. We were interested in a pathway that degrades a specific compound of interest. Um, so we used our cheminformatics to predict the pathway. We applied this approach to predict genes for the pathway. But then we also did um, RNA-seq on cells growing on that compound and another compound, and we looked at differential expression. So crossing differential expression with genes predicted through this approach gave us uh, on the order of 10 candidates. That is a very reasonable number of candidates to test in the lab, and two of those turned out to have uh, the activity. So that's kind of the workflow uh, here. Um, so, okay, I've gotten you, a, a, you know, hopefully excited about cheminformatics and you're like, well, okay, I want to try this. Um, how do I do that? So we have an app in KBase that lets you run uh, cheminformatics. Um, the app is called PICAX. PICAX is not an acronym. I generally don't like to use acronyms for my tools because uh, I think you end up with names that have nothing to do with what the tool does. So I chose PICAX, which also has nothing to do with what my tool does. But it's because PICAX is a tool for creating mines, which ironically enough is an acronym. And mines are, again, metabolic and silico network expansions. So um, the PICAX runs the cheminformatics tools on a set of input compounds and produces predicted novel reactions and compounds. Um, it's, used, it's based on an open source uh, toolkit called RDKit. RDKit is amazing. Thank God they made it open source. Um, and uh, it basically, if you read anybody doing cheminformatics and novel reaction prediction, I, I would bet you even money that they're using RDKit and I would win most of the time. Um, so it includes, uh, PICAX has tools for visualization and rapid creation of reaction rules in our MINE website, uh, it's there. Um, Multiprocessing, database and chirality, uh, all that's built into the MINE database. And it uses smarts um, to describe the reaction rules. And that's because RDKit uses smarts. Um, smart strings look like this. Basically, it's the dot stands for two different substrates. So there's two different reactive sites. Uh, and basically, it says these look for the smart, this smart string and one molecule, look for this smart string and another molecule, and convert those structures that correspond to these smart strings into this and you'll have your product and that's how it works. Um, so, you know, this smart string corresponds to this structure, this corresponds to this structure and the rule when applied makes this structure. Um, so how does PICAX work? So you start by specifying your starting compounds, which can be a model, an entire model. So it'll use every compound in the model in that case or a compound set which you can import from a TSV um, and KBase. And uh, so it could be like one compound in a compound set or multiple compounds. And you specify rule sets you're interested in, and I'll show you what the UI looks like in a minute, uh, which could be right now is limited to our enzymatic or spontaneous rules. If you're out there making awesome cheminformatics rules, um, please email me. I would love to have your rules in the system. We're working on adding retro rules, but there's some technical challenges to doing that. But we also collaborate with the Broadbelt and Tayo Lab, and they're working on some really nice rules too. Um, you can specify the number of generations you want to apply. Here I'm, uh, I'm running two generations, which means I run my rules once, I get generation one. I run my rules again, I get generation two. I actually wouldn't get these return reactions until I run my rules a third time. 
Um, so that's just, you, you get the return reactions once you run on the current generation. But that does happen. You will get predicted reactions that go the opposite way. Uh, rules are applied iteratively, but we talked earlier about combinatorial explosion. Yes, I hear you. Uh, it happens. It's a very big problem. Um, so we have to apply filters. Um, and the way we can limit the compounds retained in each generation, that's how pickaxe works. You give it a limit. You say, I only want, I know you made 50,000 compounds. I only want to keep 3,000 of them. And so how does it pick which 3,000 to keep? Well, you can say, well, I'll keep everything that hits the known databases, the model seed, which includes keg and metapsych. So model seed is a merger of keg and metapsych. Um, we have a paper coming out on model seed and NAR um, this year. Um, so hopefully. <laughs> Um, it's in revision. Uh, and then uh, we have, uh, you can specify a target list of compounds that you absolutely want to keep if you encounter them. So if you're looking for pathways to a very specific molecule, you can say like, I want to, I want to keep that if we hit it. And this is where the crucial thing for us comes in. Um, you can say, I want to keep any, any hit, any compound that hits a peak in my metabolomics data. Um, and then the filtering will strip out things that don't uh, randomly strip out things that don't meet these criteria until it gets down to your limit per generation. So here's what the UI looks like in KBase. You guys are pretty familiar with KBase apps at this point. So here's where you input your starting uh, compounds. Again, you can give it an entire model or a compound set. Um, here's where you give your target compounds. That's a compound set only. Um, here's where you get your um, metabolomic status. You give it this chemical abundance matrix. Um, and you can specify, you can choose not to specify a condition if you want, and it will just try to um, hit any metabolite that's mentioned this, in this matrix, or you can specify a condition here. Um, and then it will only choose the, remember your conditions are presence absence. So the way it chooses is if there's a non-zero value, it's going to assume it's there and choose it. So if you have presence absence data, this will work perfectly, but there's no thresholding mechanism in here at this point. Then you pick a rule set. You can pick multiple rule sets. You can run the spontaneous and enzymatic rules at once if you'd want to. You give a number of generations. The default is one, so if you want multiple generations, you'll have to adjust that. And then the maximum hits per peak. So here's the thing. Once you hit a peak with a compound, um, and it's gonna do formula matching for the FTICR data. It is capable, although this isn't tested, so if it doesn't work well, don't come after me yet. Um, the, it, is ca it is hypothetically capable of handling cheminformatics data that's annotated with entry strings or smiles as well, not just formula. Um, but you get uh, hits per peak. Um, so it, you, one, problem is once it finds a single compound that matches the formula in a peak, it is very good at then finding more compounds that match the formula in that peak. Um, and so it will rapidly find thousands of, you know, small variations like I moved this double bond here and look, I found another one. Um, it's very, lots of small variations of compounds that can um, hit a peak. And so we establish a limit and it will just, it will guarantee you to keep the first 10. It doesn't mean it won't keep beyond the first 10, but it will guarantee you the first 10 if you pick 10. And then max compounds per generation, you pick 3000. So this is all about being able to explore farther and down the rabbit hole and not run into the combinatorial explosion. That's the whole idea of the filtering mechanism. Currently the filtering is random. So if it makes 100,000 compounds, it's gonna randomly discard 97,000 until it gets to 3,000. Um, eventually I'd like to implement um, structural diversity as the criteria instead, but that's not um, happening yet. And you can use these criteria if you're like, I don't care about making model seed compounds, you can uncheck that box. And finally you give the name. So the output of this thing is a model. The nice thing about that, if you're like, well, I want to use these pathways for this, that, and the other thing that KBase doesn't do, but I know Cobra Pi or, or Cobra Toolbox does do, you can export that model with all the chemistry predicted by this tool into SBML, or you can export as, in a, as a, uh, you know, TSV or whatever format you want. Um, or in the gap filling tool, you have the ability of specifying this model as a additional database for gap filling. So it will then, 
use this chemistry to gap fill your model. So if you're like, I want to grow my model on, you know, this compound and there's no pathway for consuming that compound. Um, well, I'm going to run cheminformatics on that compound first and then gap, attempt to gap fill my model on the cheminformatics predicted chemistry plus the um, standard biochemistry from the model C, and it will combine both into a single network and gap fill from it. So that's very powerful. Basically lets you fully integrate a metabolic model with hypothetical chemistry with metabolomics data, um, which is what we wanna do here. Um, so that's the acknowledgements. I know I've got some time left. I'm gonna jump into, um, I wanna talk about the, um, uh, the acknowledgements are important, so I'll just quickly. Um, this is the K-Base team, and uh, you know this is some subset of my group that managed to get together for a photo. We do have beaches in Chicago. I know you guys all think we're a frozen wasteland, but we have beaches. You can't go to them now, but someday um, you can go to those beaches. Um, so I want to show you what the output of pickaxe looks like. Um, I'm going to jump into this narrative. Um, this is the output. It's, it gives you an overview. So it says, uh, in this case, I ran for three generations on a, I believe, a um, metagenome model. And it gave me this output. Um, and I'll start with the overview. So it tells you the number of rules it ran. I ran with both our chem and for both our um, enzymatic rules and our spontaneous rules. Um, so 344 of them. There were more than 344 rules run. It, 344 produced the reaction. So that's what that number is. Um, this is the number of reactions um, and compounds produced after filtering. So the filter has been applied. This is the number of reactions and compounds that were filtered. Yes, that's uh, 899,000. So when I said combinatorial explosion, and that's with filtering, by the way. So like when I say combinatorial explosion, I really, really meant it. Um, if we did not filter this number after three generations would be far, far bigger than this. Um, and then the number of generations, the starting compounds in my model was 1,364 with structures. It will only include structures, uh, compounds with structures. So if you give me a model that has no structures in it, if you don't put structures in your, in your SPML file and you upload that model in the K-Base and you run it, it is not going to work very well. You have to give me um, structures. Uh, if you build a model in K-Base, it automatically has structures because it's tied to our database. Um, you've got compounds generated. So this is how many compounds are generated on top of the starting compounds. How many of the starting compounds were in model seed? Um, how many of the generated compounds were in model seed? So it found 742, in three steps, it found 742 additional model seed compounds. Um, so our, our rules are not perfect. If we had a, a more comprehensive rule set, which we are working on doing with our collaborators, um, uh, this would be a, a much bigger number, I believe. But you know, these would be bigger numbers too. So it's a double-edged sword. How many peaks in our data set matched our compound? So at the moment, I think for the FTICR data, this app, it's kind of weird, but at the moment, this app is the app you'd have to run to figure out how many of those FTICR peaks actually occur in your model. And the answer is 24 of 3,516 that were in the, this condition. So this was condition specific FTICR. We ran the, all the peaks that had non-zero values in this specific condition, which was the ERP A SW. Um, and uh, it was 24. How many peaks matched generated compounds? 1,881. So more than half of the peaks the cheminformatics found candidate pathways and candidate compounds for more than half the peaks, um, while the model contained only 24. So um, the cheminformatics is really expanding how much of the metabolomics can be, you know, hypothetically explained by the model. Remember, we're in Wonderland, so it's only hypothetical. The predictions here are just that. They're predictions that need to be investigated further. Um, per, but the nice thing is it gives you mechanistic hypotheses that lets you design experiments to actually do further investigation. Um, how many peaks, now, just as a crazy thing, this app, it doesn't need to do this for for the you know, app to do what it does, but it also tries to find all these peaks in the model seed. So if you take these 3,516 formula, I'll drill this point home. 
3516 formula that FTICR gave you after being annotated with formulator and you compare it to every the formula the formula of every known molecule and keg metapsych and other databases that are in the model seed something like 30,000 molecules um, known biochemical molecules you get 768 hits so that's dark matter the 768 isn't the dark matter but the everything else um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, we only generated, um, you know, 742 comp model C compounds. So there's other model C compounds that we didn't generate, um, but they are in the model C. So uh, the next step in this, uh, although it's not a tool we have in KBase at the moment, is to integrate the chemistry from pickaxe and the model C into a model and try to activate and reach as many of these you know, peaks as possible in a single flux solution. And that's a tool we're working on now. Um, but you would want to merge both the chem the pickaxe network and the model C networks. You could benefit from all of these um, findings. Um, but these 768 are probably quite far, many of them are probably quite far from the compounds in your model. Um, and their formula matches. So again, formula matches, you want structure matches. Formula matches are, you know, really a good chance that they're not right. Um, the starting compounds that hit the peak, there's 28. So there's 28 compounds in the model that hit 24 peaks. This is a very important thing to drill in. Multiple compounds will hit the same peak because multiple compounds will have the same formula. There's 15,000 generated compounds that hit 1,800 peaks. So this gets a lot where I, I, I mentioned previously, the model, you know, the cheminformatics is really good at once it finds one peak, one compound that hits a peak, it will find many more very, very quickly. Um, so that's what it's doing. It's, it's finding, you know, uh, get the math here, eight or nine compounds, uh, you know, per uh, peak. Um, and this based on this analysis and then the model seed uh, compounds with peaks 2071. Um, so if we go up uh, to generations, the generations tab shows you how many compounds you had after every generation. So you started with 1364. Uh, we ran two rule sets with a limit of 3000. So it's keeping 6000. If it keeps 8000, it means like your filtering criteria um, was maxed out. Uh, and it, so there's no random sampling anymore at this stage. It's keeping everything because, uh, because it's hitting that many peaks. So it kept uh, uh, 6,000 and 8,000 and 10,000. It filtered 26,000 in the first generation, 291,000 in the second generation, and 415,000 in the third generation. So this is an interesting phenomenon because um, this is scaling faster than the number of input molecules. And this is because of chemical diversity. Um, you're, you're inputting a broader chemical diversity with each generation, and this is leading to even more uh, chemistry being generated. So that's the, that's the other issue of combinatorial explosion is it's not just exponential um, increase, it's like exponential of an exponential. Um, but uh, the nice thing is this tool, because it keeps all the peak hits, um, or at least a representative set of them, um, lets you very quickly generate chemistry to reach you know, over half the peaks you found. Now, I mean, these may not be right, but at least you have candidate pathways to look at, and then you can use um, experiments and correlation uh, and other things um, to try and find uh, if those, uh, try, to try, try to see if those um, predicted pathways and compound structures are right. Uh, we have rules. Uh, so this just lists all the rules and how many reactions came from each rule. So you can see like the most aggressive rule. So 2.1.1, the enzymatic rule 2.1.1, which is just the EC number 2.1.1. So if you look at reactions with the EC number 2.1.1, you'll see what this rule, um, approximately what this rule does. And uh, there should be a picture of the rule, but we've temporarily removed those. Um, and then the peaks, so this is all the peaks that you have and what compounds were found for each peak and whether or not uh, they were in the mo original model and pickaxe or wherever. Um, and the compounds and reactions, currently it's only showing the first 100. I'm hoping to fix this, but it only shows the first 100. But if you wanna see the full set um, of chemical rea of reactions and compounds predicted 
Um, uh, the way to do that is uh, if we just search for, just click on the reaction here. Um, like, I'll look at, I'll do this one. Uh, not connected to my narrative, so I'll have to reload. Um, but if you click on the model and the data panel, you'll see uh, what that reaction, what that full model looks like, and including, uh, you'll actually be able to see all the chemical structures um, that were predicted. So you can see what those um, compounds actually look like. Um, so that's uh, the, the, um, the workflow and K-Base. Of course, I've restarted this thing, so I can't. I'll have to wait for it to load. While we're waiting for this, um, I can take questions. That's, that's what I have at the moment. So thank you, Chris. That was fascinating. Um, there's been, you know, there's not really been any questions into the Zoom chat. I know there's been an ongoing discussion over in, um, in Discord. Uh, one question that just came up was, does PICAX filter out thermodynamically improbable products and formulas, or do the enzymatic rules already account for this? Uh, the enzymatic rules uh, will account for this to uh, some extent, but only very limited. Um, there's some crazy structures that'll definitely come out of this. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, we are looking at, um, like my collaborators, the Broadbelt Lab and the Tayo Lab um, at Northwestern, um, they're really looking at this, um, adding um, our group contribution-based cheminformatics methods, integrating that in the PICAX so we can run those. And if you, like, if you get a group that the group contribution method just doesn't even recognize, well, you could potentially just throw those out. So that would, what'll happen, we will add those to PICAX uh, as that, um, those methods mature, and those will show up as new checkboxes in, uh, in this um, interface. Uh, so you'll see new checkboxes with the thermodynamics. Like there might, be, there might be a threshold for the predicted delta G value. Um, and, uh, you know, so what we could filter everything below that threshold, um, uh, everything with the delta G above that threshold, a really large uh, delta G for the reaction. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, so if you have, when you have a chance, if you want to take a look over there, I know Jonica has been busy answering a lot of questions um, already over in Discord. Um, one thing I, I would be interested in, Chris, if you would kind of give us your, I don't know, uh, I'm sort of interested to hear about your perspectives on how this field has advanced over the last, say, 10 years or you know, where some of the, I mean, this is certainly an exciting advance because you're able to now bring metabolic information together with metagenomic information to really build better models. So, I, I mean, my perspective is I remember, and maybe my memory is bad, but it seemed to me about 10 years ago or so when I was just learning about genome scale modeling and FBA, I remember going to a SIDAC meeting and talking to you at a poster and being really excited because you were starting to have tools for automated automatically annotating genomes and I thought that was amazing at the time and maybe maybe that maybe my timing is not off, is off on that but kbase at the time wasn't even a thing and so you know how fast the the tools have developed and where we're at today the things you're you're showing if you could just kind of give our our um, our listeners your perspectives on how fast that has happened and and what some of the potential is going forward um, that would be really interesting to hear. Yeah, um, so the, I, I think, uh, you know, the, this field is really taking off. I might actually have an open narrative over here. I have another set of brown tabs. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, here we go. Because this one's not connected either, so I won't be able to... Um, Uh, so I, I think the um, metabolomics uh, and the genomics combined um, are really, um, the metabolomics technology is really exploding right now. And I think we're in a, um, you know, in 1990, uh, which is, uh, 
30 years ago now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> depressingly, um, you know, there was this exciting revolution in, in uh, sequencing. And then, you know, with the first genomes emerging, and then in the 2000s, um, uh, next gen sequencing coming along and like blowing things up again. And there was this golden age of discovery where we went from I remember like, uh, you know, we had hundreds of genomes. And I was like, let's, you know, we built the model seed and we built like 130 models of the model seed. And it was a large fraction of the genomes that existed in the day. And then we're like, let's build 3000 models. And that was a large fraction. And now there's, you know, over 400,000 genomes and that's not counting the mags. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think with metabolomics, we're, we're getting there. Um, we're, we're about to enter a new age of metabolomics um, because a combination of machine learning, um, being able to annotate metabolomics data better and the combination of improved instrumentation. So I talked about like, well, they're working on adding MSMS to FTICR and, there, and the non-FTICR machines, Orbitrap um, and whatnot are, are, are getting better too. Um, and uh, the separations technology is getting better. And not, by getting better, I mean like currently retention time gives you some very limited information. It basically tells you like this, this peak is different from this other peak because it has a different retention time. That's kind of what it tells you at the moment. Um, but new uh, technologies that are coming along for separation that are not GC and LC, um, liquid chromatography or gas chromatography, those new technologies might give you a lot more information from the retention time. Um, they might be able to separate stereoisomers. Um, be, you know, the, this is ion dispersion and new um, techniques. And the columns are getting a lot longer because the instruments are getting smaller. So all of this is coming together at the same time with machine learning to make a, a golden age of metabolomics. And um, if you can see the chemistry, then the tools I've just shown you can map the chemistry together. And, and it goes from uh, currently you have this, you know, unknown proteins, which is all you have. You have biologists working in labs to discover painstakingly one at a time, um, individual chemical reactions. And, you know, the, eventually, you know, a year later, those new reactions get put into databases. And then a year later, you know, all the annotating algorithms get updated and then those new reactions might actually show up in a model. And I'm being very generous to say that'll happen in two years. Um, but now imagine that you discover all the chemistry and, and it becomes a big connect the dots with computational tools that integrate genomics data. And that, that like that, the computational tools to do that connect the dots, I would argue, you know, the pickaxe tool combined with all the advanced uh, um, annotators combined with RNA-seq data um, they're getting there. Um, so we'll be able to connect the dot, the chemistry of an environment um, uh, overnight um, and, uh, and then do high throughput. You know, there's a high throughput instrumentation. So high throughput um, uh, confirmation of predicted functions, predicted reactions on robotic systems, you know, using droplets that can float magically through the air. Um, that's where we're at today. So we're in a golden age of um, biochemical biological enzyme, enzymatic discovery, which is gonna fuel a golden age of synthetic biology. So yeah, I think it's an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Thanks for, for that perspective, Chris. I think, you know, it's important for the summer school participants to, you know, understand that the things that they're seeing this week really are, you know, on the, <laughs> I guess the bleeding edge of, you know, the most advanced work that's being done today. So, you know, if, if people are having a difficult time understanding and following, understand that, you know, the people who are doing this work are really in the stages of, you know, just developing this material. So um, this is an opportunity for, as you're learning about these things, to get engaged with and to get involved with things that are really exciting and, and, and moving forward at a rapid pace. So thanks again, Chris and Jonica, for sharing your expertise with us. Um, and Hyun and, uh, and Mark as well. This morning, it was a really fantastic session. And I think seeing these things coming alive in KBase and being accessible to a lot of researchers is, is making it even, uh, you know, exponentially more powerful for everybody. So uh, I think we're at the end of our time.
And uh, we're going to wrap up for today and go into our student sessions this afternoon. So to the, uh, the public audience, um, invite you to join us again in the morning. Um, we'll be picking up again at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And tomorrow we're going to be talking about incorporating some of these ideas in metabolic models, metagenomics, and metabolomics into e uh, ecosystem scale reactive transport models. And so that'll be kind of the final step of our uh, envisioned pipeline that's under development as we speak. And so thanks again for everybody who joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And please continue that discor uh, discourse over in Discord as you um, meet with your fellow classmates and with the instructors who are over there um, answering questions. Uh, thanks, everyone, and see you soon. Uh, see you tomorrow.